Charlie, this part, part of the program is pretty informal, so you can start with everybody. Right. I would just, just introduce yourself. I think everybody here knows you. Well, gosh, I hope so. Got an infamous. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, it looks like we are actually right on time. So I'm Charlie Craven. I'm from Colorado. Um, I was here. I wasn't here. I was somewhere else in 2014. Is that what we just decided? Fort Worth, yeah. Um, Fort Worth. Did I? But I wasn't in Dallas. Was it? I feel like I was in uh, Dallas I also. Think so. Maybe I was in Austin. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big state. I don't know where it all is. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure whether that's a compliment or not. Well, it was a hotel no, there, somewhere. Hey, hey, Charlie, could you move that spool out of the background, please? The one. Thank you. I will need to because I'm going to use it. So <laughs> in a minute, it'll be dangling from the hook. Um, so anyway, I own, own a fly shop up in Colorado, up in Arvada, Colorado. It's just northwest of Denver. And uh, um, my thing is sort of fly tying. I've, I've been a fly tire since I was eight years old. I've been a commercial fly tire since I was 12. Um, and I'm 47 now, so however many years that works out to be. Um, you know, my thing uh, as a fly tire, I, I've t it's not that I'm a better tire than everybody else in the world because I'm super talented. Um, I'm a good fly tire because I've tied a lot of flies, a ton of flies. Um, so one of, the, one of the cool things I have advantage-wise as far as teaching classes and things like that is I've made all those mistakes before. I've made lots more mistakes than you guys have made. Um, so I can kind of anticipate some of that when you have a question about whether the tail's not flaring, things like that. Um, I've generally encountered it, and that's just one of, the, one of the advantages of having done this a long time. I never thought it would be valuable to anybody in the world, but here you guys are. So um, I got even with my dad. Um, so with that, I'm going to tie you a couple flies. Um, and I'm really, you know, I, what, does this, I have about an hour? You have an hour. Okay. Um, I'm really sort of open. So, I mean, I, I have, um, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about fly design and things like that as I go. Um, but I, I try not to have a real structured program. So if there's something you want to see or a technique that you want to see or a fly or a question, um, this is a small group. This will be easy. I mean, I can, I can, I got all kinds of stuff in this bag. So I can kind of do whatever, you know, within reason, whatever you guys might want to see. Um, but to kind of get us going, I'm going to tie you a, a, one of my new flies. It's a uh, two bit, called a two bit stone. Um, are, are you guys familiar with my two-bit hooker fly? Hell yeah. Yeah? Okay. So this is a takeoff on that, and, and this will be a golden stone. Um, and from a design standpoint, the, the two bits, you know, and I, I'm just going to talk for a minute. I'm going to scoot this back because um, I don't want to put my glasses on. So from a design standpoint, th there's a lot of flies that just sort of end up happening because they're a variation of this fly that you used and you changed the color. And, um, and I see a lot of that. You know, I saw... I sell. I Umpa sells my flies. So um, I design flies. Umpa sells them. They distribute them. Um, and I see a lot of uh, a lot of flies from a lot of different companies, Umpa included, um, that aren't terribly well designed. Not not really well thought out. It's not that they don't catch fish, but they're not designed. There there is a design to a fly that makes a difference. Um, how the fly sinks, how the fly floats. What, that's one of the things I always look at on new flies. Is what's better about it. Um, you know, there's a thousand and one variations of a pheasant tail. What's better about it? Um, so what I always try to do is come up with a fly, come up with a, a reason to make the fly better or solve a problem, and that's that's my big thing. Um, so what the two bit series of flies did, and those are all tied. If, if you haven't fished with them, they're tied with two tungsten beads. Um, so it's a skinny little fly tied with two heavy beads. Um, so not only is it heavy, it's not enough to just on a nymph, not just to make it heavier. It's easy to make a fly heavy. It's hard to make a fly that's heavy and skinny. Um, skinny is the part that people miss on making flies sink. When your flies are big and bulky, they don't sink near as fast as flies that are more slender. Um, I call them slick. You know, a slick body fly is going to sink faster than a bulky body fly. Um, and conversely, you know, if you think about dry flies, we'll, we'll kind of, this will segue into the next fly that I'll do. Um, what, what makes your dry flies float? It's not goop, it's not gink, it's not any of that. It's surface area. Surface area. Solely surface area. That's what hackle is, is surface area. Um, foam doesn't make your fly float. Foam keeps your fly from getting soaked. Foam doesn't get, get waterlogged. Um, but it doesn't really make your fly float because there's generally not much surface area on it. So surface area is what makes a fly float. Surface area is also, on the skinny side of that, what makes your fly sink. Um, and that's sort of the, the thing that I work on on, all, on a lot of my flies. That's what I always try to work in is, is capitalizing on whatever pieces I can to make the fly do the job better. One of the reasons that two-bit hooker has become such a hugely popular fly is even if you fish poorly, it's going to fish better than you. 
um, because it gets down and stays down where it's supposed to be. You can't really do it wrong because most people don't want to fish enough lead, so that fly kind of has the lead in it for you, the weight in it for you. So that was the idea there. Now, as I started fishing that more and fishing the Arkansas River up uh, out of Buena Vista, Salida, uh, more and more, which I've, I've done for the last 10 years, um, there's a ton of golden stones in there. And in Colorado, there's golden stones in almost every river. Um, now, the big mature golden stone is about a size 6, so it's a pretty good-sized bug. You know, and they'll hatch in the spring. Um, but there are smaller, kind of immature, juvenile golden stones in the river all year long. So I tie this more in a... This is a... Uh, Find the, not that way, that way. So that's a fire hole 839 size 14. Um, so, have you guys used any of these hooks? Yeah, yeah, just going yeah. on the side. Um, so if you've used these, you've also figured out that their sizes is, sizes are not based in reality whatsoever. They call that a 14. That's a 10 in anybody else's book, um, which is fine. You just need to know that ahead of time. You know, the the what they call an 18 is about a 15. Um, and they seem to be pretty good hooks. I'll talk a little bit about this. And, and Joe Mathis is a really nice guy, the guy that owns this company. Um, I, and I don't mean to badmouth it at all, but I'm a little torn on these competition-style hooks that have the long, the long point. See how long that hook point is? Um, the spear. That's a point right there. Well, I'm gonna have to put my glasses on now. The spear. So the distance from the hook point back here to the inside of the gap, uh, inside of the bend is really long and what the reason that came about is competition hooks are supposed to be barbless so in taking the barb off what they've done is elongated the, the hook point so that it stays stuck stays hooked in the fish better um, for competition purposes my catch on this and i've like i said i'm sort of torn on it is that barbless hook doesn't have a barb that tears the fish up on the way out but it does definitely make two holes in the fish going in and out it goes all the way through um, oddly it seems that almost every fish i hook on on this hook it's hooked right in the tip of the snout. Um, it's a, sort of that beak point. We don't have a great angle for it, but you can kind of see how that point comes up in toward the shank. Um, so I'm a little torn on these. I, they, they do hook, they do hold really well. I'm not quite sure how I feel about two holes in them instead of just one. Um, so you can argue with yourself about that later tonight. There's, there's my thoughts on it. So anyway, this is on a, on a size 14. If you guys have questions along the way, just keep them to yourselves. <laughs> We're getting so formal in here. We'll be all quiet and polite. You'll find out real quick you don't need to do that. So this, when I first came up with this fly, I, uh, you know, I wanted to make a, a two-bit, a two-bit stone. Obviously, uh, you know, take off of the two-bit hooker, and so I used two beads, and I fought with it and fought with it and fought with it, and you know the. Occam's razor thing of the easy answer is always the simple one. Um, I couldn't make the fly really have the profile that I needed with two beads, and then I figured out that I needed to use three beads. So that was even better because it made that fly skinny and, and super heavy. Now the problem was is I used three tungsten, tungsten beads on the first few that I tied, and three tungsten beads, I'll tell you now, is just too heavy. Um, you will lose a buck worth of hook in tungsten beads at a time, one right after the other. Um, unless you're like in the deepest, fastest water. So three tungsten beads is too many. So what I sort of settled on is one tungsten bead and two brass beads. And these are three thirty-second beads on this, you know, size 14 hook. It's not, it's really more like a 12. Oh, here. Yeah. Put that, let's put that over that cord. I was like, who's in the camera? That's my face. Are we good there? I lost my bead. Is that gray hair? No. Better get your eyes checked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have some silver, yeah. Go sit down. <laughs> sit down quietly. All right, so what I've done here, I'll get this back up here in the vice where you can see it. Which piece is Okay. I need one for your background and one for my background. So what I've done there is I've put all three of those beads on there. The first one, the one closest to the hook eye is the tungsten bead. Although I can't say that that makes it dang bit of difference where you put that. Um, 
I will say that a tungsten bead, turn this this way to show you, a tungsten bead is less counter drilled. See the hole in the back of that bead? It's not as deep as the hole in the back of that bead. See how that bead's got a bigger hole? So the brass beads have a bigger hole in the back of them. And, and uniquely in the case of this fly, um, we do want a little bit of that space. You'll see why here as I, as I tie the fly. But, um, so that's why I put the tungsten bead on the front. I don't know that it would fish any different if you put it in the, you know, put it in the middle. But I'm going to start with some 140 denier <coughs> UTC in wood duck gold. So that's a, just a nice gold color. And it's 140, so it's, it's twice as big as your usual 6-70 denier thread. Because I want it to build up here in this case. So I'm going to start this thread here. I'll show you another trick. How many of you have seen my, seen my programs before? Anybody here seen my program before? All right, well, you guys keep it to yourselves. So let me try to act like this is new stuff. Um, here's, a, here's a trick to kind of start your thread. I'll, I'll throw a lot of this stuff in. I'll throw in as much of this as you'll let me. Um, so rather than tie my thread on with a long tag, where I hold on to it, and this, and then come in and cut this tag end off. When I was a kid, thread was really expensive. So I conserved it. So when I start my thread, I have about a centimeter of thread sticking out of my bobbin tube. And I just pinch the thread against the hook. And I'll make a few turns, and I didn't have to cut the tag end off. It's not that I'm wasting the thread. It's not that I'm worried about the thread. It's that when you have an order of a thousand dozen pheasant tails to tie, that makes them go that much faster. You don't have to take that extra step. So it's more about cutting the tag end off. And it's easy to do on a big hook. Um, if you kind of get in practice with that, all, all I did was pinch it against the far side of the hook and then start wrapping. So I'm going to come back here. And, you know, I usually use the barb as a reference on so many of these, but these new hooks are, are pretty oddly shaped. So I'm coming just to the apex of the bin, just where the hook shank and the bin come together, just off the, the round part of the shank. And I'm going to build a little nub of thread there. So I'm going to spin my thread up. And this nub, we're going to do a biot tail on this fly, but this nub is not so much to help split the biot tails, which it does do as it is to elongate the body of the fly a bit. So you can see that we've got kind of a weird angle there. See that little nub that we've got? It's just like a football shape kind of thing. And I'm going to tie in some biots. How many of you have, have no trouble at all tying biot tails? <laughs> oh, good. None of you are liars. <laughs> all right. I'm impressed. And we're all officially didn't understand the question. <laughs> Somebody who doesn't use by it, yeah. All right, so I'm going to use goose, or I'm sorry, these are uh, turkey biots. This is a wild turkey biot dyed gold. So you can see there's barring on it, and that's why I use the wild ones instead of the natural, or the white, I should say, domestic. Um, th this has got a little bit more barring on it. You can see the biot itself has got just a little variegation to it. So when I take these off, you can see I've cut these off. Yeah, that's better. Um, see how they're curving down? So to get these opposed, there's a little trick to this. And like I said, I teach a lot. I still teach a lot of beginning fly tying classes. Um, so I, I know everybody has trouble with this. So I'll kind of try to go through this. I've got a ratty edge on that one by that, though. I don't like it. So I'm going to take these two off. And they're both curving down as they came off the feather. So to get these opposed, rather than fumble with both these little short biots, and these are fairly long biots, and they're still short. Rather than fumble with the biots, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my hand over, and I'm going to grab this way. If you guys, can, if my hand's in the way, shout, because i got to actually see it here. I'm going to grab the near biot, and I'm going to turn my hand back over and stack it right back up on top. So I didn't really mess with the feather. I didn't move my hand much. So now I've got them opposed and curving away from each other. Okay. i got to undo it first. Oh, that's going to be way better, don't you think? Yeah, good yeah. idea. All right. Um, so that's as they came off. They're just both flat, curving down. I'm going to turn my hand over, grab one, turn my hand back over, put it right back on top. So now they're opposed. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, now to get these even, i got to do it where I can see them, but I'll just sort of slide in between my fingers until their tips become even. And once I've got them there, I'm going to take these two bites. I'm going to measure them. 
Um, here's, here's another thing. When you're sitting down to tie a fly, you, you got an idea you're going to tie a crawdad, you're going to tie a leech, you're going to tie a whatever, uh, golden stone nymph. Um, when you're sitting down to tie it, the worst thing you can do if you're trying to come up with a new fly, to try to come up with a better fly, is to go look on the internet or in your stack of books and see what everybody else did, because then you're just copying somebody else's idea. Um, not that that's bad, not that that doesn't work, but I mean, I have a website myself, you know, copy, copy away. But if you're trying to kind of come up with a new idea, what, what I find is that you'll, you'll see artificial fly proportions, and that's where you know, your, ha your tail is half, a, half of a shank length, your tail is a whole shank length. What, what is the proportion of the real bug's tail? How, how long is it? Um, in the case of a stonefly, its tail is as long as its body. Um, you know, it's not a half a shank length like everybody, everybody says that your pattern should be. The tail is much longer. Um, now, with a thick buyout like this, I can't really go a whole shank length because it's going to make the fly stiff. Um, a natural bug's tail collapses when a fish eats it. Same thing like a trico spinner. It's got big, long tails. If you make stiff, synthetic tails on the tail of a, of a trico, it won't fit in the fish's mouth. It gets pushed out. So I'm going to put this, you know, three quarters of a length uh, of a shank length long, and I'll butt them in my fingers. And here's the trick. So, and I think we have a decent angle here for this. This might be a great angle for this. I'm going to take these two bias and I'm going to push them on either side of the hook right up to the end of that nub, and I've got that pre-measured point right at the end of my fingertips here. So if I set these right here and take a rapid thread over them, what's going to happen? They'll start shifting around. They're going to twist. So to get around that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to twist them toward me. My thread's always going to twist things away from me, so I'm going to twist these about a quarter turn toward me. And I, I really do think this is going to show up well. So I'm going to put a quarter turn around there. Okay. So see how those biots are off-center? All I'm going to do, watch my thread. I'm not really pulling on my thread. I'm not moving my bobbin. I'm just tightening the thread. And see how I let those biots come straight to the top? I didn't move the bobbin. I didn't pull around. I didn't go around the circle. I just tightened the thread so that those biots twisted to the top rather than if I had to put them on top, they'd have twisted that far to the far side. Um, once I've got them where I want them, that just you know, graciously did exactly what I wanted it to do in front of all of you. Um, I'm going to only go forward from there. If you take any turns backwards over those biots, you're going to disrupt them. You can always do, I don't care where these ends go. These ends are what I'm, what I'm worried about. So I've got those biots right up on top, nice wide spread, and sort of long, okay? So I'm going to cut these biots off just short of the beads there, and just run forward over them. Now, as you tie this fly, I'll, I'll give you a little warning. At no point do you want these beads jammed together. You're not going to build the body right up to the back of the beads and jam them tight together. You want to leave a little bit of space. Am I going too fast? You mean space between them or space behind the third? Um, yes, a little bit of all of that. A little bit of all of that. I get going, I feel like I'm going 100 miles an hour. So. If, I, if I am, shout and I'll talk slower. Are you making a joke about Texas? No, actually, I, I appreciate slow talkers because I don't hear very well. I tell that to my wife all the time. Just say it slower. You don't have to say it louder. That's like work for you. Yeah, yeah, about how you think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I'm, I'm really about mid-shank on this fly. I'm going to tie in a piece of small black wire right along the near side of the hook. And I'm going to wrap back over it right up to the base of that nub. And I'll clip that back in my material spray. So now to build the body, here's another thing that's on an artificial fly that's not really so much on the real, on the real bug. Um, you know, conventional wisdom from fly tying books tells you that you're going to build a tapered abdomen. Um, Stone flies do not have a tapered abdomen. They have a very cylindrical, tube-shaped abdomen. Um, in some cases, they can be sort of flattened. Some of them are flatter than others. Um, but they're pretty tube shaped, especially in this sort of immature form. Um, so I'm going to build a cylinder back and forth here. I'm going to make several laps. And this is why I'm using the bigger thread here. Like so, you guys were so quiet during all that. We mesmerized. We mesmerized by wrapping thread up and down the hook. So 
Um, you can see pretty cylindrical body, not much taper to it, and I've still got space up here with these beads. So I'm going to take this piece of wire and I'm going to spiral wrap this forward through the body. Right up off the edge. Catch that with a couple turns, and then with that fine wire, you can really you can just pop it off. And I will whip finish. So I'm going to whip finish that 140 here because I don't need that big thread anymore. And I'm going to come in with the same color thread, but in 70 denier. It couldn't be in a worse spot. All right, so same color. And I'm going to overlap just to the high point of that abdomen. And again, I just want to sort of exaggerate the space between those beads. Can you see what's, what's there? You don't want to jam it together. And I'm going to tie in a piece of flash, first of all. So here is my secret patented Charlie Craven flash container for when you travel. Whoa. It's a I, I've got them. They're, they're, uh, I've got them here in my bag. They're $4 each. <laughs> <laughs> they're trademarked. The tricks are doing away with all those things. So well, they are, so grab them up while you can. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you can buy stainless steel. It's okay. They'll still be there. The, those are going to be $12.99. Yeah. <laughs> So, so what this stuff is, as I start to joke here, um, this is, well, the camera didn't like that at all, did it? Um, this is Mirage Flash. So this is not Pearl Flash, but it's Mirage, which is a little bit more opalescent, a little bit more metallic than Pearl. Um, and it's 1-100, so it's thin. It's just a thin little strand of this stuff. And I'm going to tie this, just a single strand, right up here on top of this abdomen. And... If, as you guys watch, you guys have a great angle on this. This is actually working really nicely. Um, I use that sort of thread torque anticipation, which is what we did with the biots. Um, when I tie a lot of stuff in, I very rarely do pin traps or, or uh, loose traps. I kind of let my thread push it to where it needs to go. So see how I can kind of control where that stops and slide that to the top. Then I'm going to draw it down. Now here's a trick to make sure that your flashbacks are always straight, um, and mine aren't always. I know that is because I've written books and somebody took a picture and put it on the back cover and all my wing cases were crooked, so now I'm aware of it. Um, if you take the, look at the top of the fly here, with these two long ends, see how I can <coughs> seesaw that until it's right square down the center of the fly? And see how easy it is to get out of square? There you go, right. Charlie, is that the same Mirage flash that comes on the spool? It, it is not. It, so it is the same material, but it's much thinner than the stuff on the spool. Um, this, you know, so the, the spooled stuff is small, medium, large. Right. This would be like extra, extra small. It's, it's a really fine strand. And, you know, honestly, I, I don't know that there's any reason that you couldn't do it with the wider stuff. Yeah. I just did it originally with this, and now it's carved in stone. All right, so I'm going to anchor that down, trim that stub out, and then this is uh, Bustard Thin Skin. And I'm going to cut a strip. I would generally say, originally I tied this fly on a 52-62 TMCO, so I'd say just slightly narrower than the gap of the hook. On this hook, it's much narrower than the gap of the hook. Um, and so I'll cut a strip and I'll hold it up here so you can see it. This is a really wide gap hook. About like so. Uh, that way. Kind of get that relative to the hook gap anyway. I'm going to get my paper backing off of this. What is that material there? Uh, this is called thin skin. So thin skin is a heavy mill plastic, and it's on a, I'll get it up here where you can see it. It's on a paper backing, like so. So when you get your oil changed and they stick that sticker on the inside of your windshield, that's what this is, just heavy mill plastic. So I'm going to peel that pa paper off. And I've got that printed piece. Now, see how thin skin has got a curve to it? Um, also, notice my flash, the same thing had a curve to it. doesn't always, but especially if it comes off the spool. Whenever you tie anything down that's got a curve, always tie it in curve down. If you tie it in curve up, like this, that piece is going to curl around, that butt end right there, it's going to curl around and be in your way during the whole rest of the fly. It only took me about 10,000 flies to figure out. If you turn that over, it's out of the way forever. So take this and turn it over. I'm going to roll it right up to the top as well. 
And you can see all that thread work right now is right on top of the front edge of the abdomen. I haven't come down off the abdomen yet. And again, I want to make sure that's all square. I tie left-handed, so when you see me spin my thread, I'm generally tightening it up rather than flattening it. Um, as I wrap left-handed, my thread will unwind and lay flat. Um, when I let it hang, it gets flat, so when I sit here and talk, it gets really flat, so I needed to spin it up a little bit there. So that was conversely to right-handed tires, actually to tighten it up. So now I'm going to take some dubbing. This is Amber Superfine Dry Fly Dubbing. Um, and the reason I use dry fly dubbing on this nymph is because it floats so well. <laughs> it keeps those tongues and beads from getting hung up on the bottom. Um, I use dry, this dry fly dubbing because I can dub it down very tightly. Um, I need to, I'm going to tie legs in on top of it here in a minute. Um, and when I first started doing these, um, or even, even later on a different fly, um, I tried using some softer dubbing in between and it just compresses too much. This dubbing I can dub down very tightly on the thread, I can control the shape and I can tie down on top of. So it is counteracted quite nicely with all those beads, so the dry fly aspect of it doesn't hurt anything. I noticed you waxed your fingers. I did. Okay, that's a good question. So when I put dubbing on the thread, I don't put dubbing wax on the thread. I just put dubbing wax on my fingers. So what I do is I touch my fingers, touch my finger to the wax, and then I kind of rub my fingers together. And now that I've done that a couple times, I've got too much on there. So it's not very little. Um, the dubbing wax is to give me traction to get a hold of the dubbing. Um, it's not to make the dubbing stick to the thread, it's to give me traction to get the dubbing twisted around the thread. Um, gooping up a bunch of dubbing wax, best case scenario, you're going to goop up your dubbing. Um, worst case scenario, there's virtually no surface area on your thread to get any adhesion out of. I do that sometimes with synthetics and stuff, but with something like Superfine, I typically don't as I'm having trouble getting it to stick. So, yeah, Superfine is, is the most doubleable stuff out there for sure. Um, actually, I'll kind of... I'm going to slide this up a little bit because I want the thread to show. Remind me to bring that back down so I don't just tie in the dark and you guys are all polite and don't say anything. <laughs> so when I start this, let me actually start this over. Here, I'm going to show you another cool trick. Hang on, come back down. You get all kinds of two-for-one freebies here. So see how I started that dubbing? I got a little knit stuck on there. Um, it's really not a huge thing right, right here where I am, but I'm going to show you how to save this. Um, if you get a knitted dubbing, or you roughed up your thread and you're about to whip finish, or you're about to tie something down and you've got a rough spot in your thread that you nicked, um, grab the bad spot. So grab that, bring your thread up over the hook, and make a dubbing loop, and then cut the bad stuff out. You can clap. <laughs> Don't, don't get carried away. There's lots more where that could. All right, so let me get this back up where you can see it. All right, so when I start dubbing, I'm going to take a clump. I'm just going to start over fresh here. I'm going to take a clump of this. Whoa, not that much. True story, one package of super fine dubbing will tie 700 dozen RS2s. I know it. I've done it. It, that, that's the honest to God truth. 700 dozen size 20 RS2s. Um, so if you have occasion in your life to buy two packages of the same color Superfine dubbing, you're either tying a whole lot or you're using too much dubbing. Or you lost it. Or you lost it. Yeah, that's, that's a viable answer. Yes, can't find it. Yeah, it happens to all of us. Yeah, yeah, somewhere, yeah. Except as soon as you come home with the, the yeah. next to the seventh one, you find, yeah, find four of them. So I'm going to pull out a club. This is you know, more dubbing than I need, but I'm going to exaggerate this a bit. So I'm going to, what I generally do is I'm going to kind of pull out a corner. And that, you know, the screen's making everything look big. But what I like to do is just get one corner of it anchored. So see how thin that strand is relative to the thread? Okay. As I work down, I'm going to raise this a bit more because I, I want you to be able to see the thread here. Um, my left hand is going to determine how much dubbing goes on the thread at a time. So that's, that's this hand here. If I move this fast and draw this dubbing out, I can make it really thin and really long. If I slow it down, I can bunch that dubbing up. So as I work here, oh, our camera doesn't like this. There you go. Yeah, the black line. Get a little more thread out here. But as I work, I'll just keep shoving this up. We're going to do our same little trick again. 
But see how I can twist that dubbing? If I leave this clump here, see how that'll make it much fatter? If I spread that out and draw down with my left hand, see how I can make control the width of that strand? I can take that clump of dubbing and go on for 20 feet if I keep feeding it out. Okay, so you saw the size of that clump of dubbing. We've got skinny down here and fat here in the middle. You can control it, but it's your left hand that distributes it that controls how much goes on at a time. It's not necessarily how tight you twist with your right hand or your, your, your dominant hand. Um, I am right-handed. I, I tie left-handed. Um, so your right hand is what's twisting it on. That's what's applying it, but your left hand is what's distributing it. Okay? So now you're going to get to see that super cool trick one more time. Try to contain yourselves. Oh, you didn't get to see it because it's not on the screen, is it? <laughs> ah, see? It was super cool the second time, too. All right, so in real life, I'm going to take and make a fairly thin strand of this. And one good rule of thumb with dubbing is you can always add more. But as you just saw, it's a lot harder to get off if you've got too much. So I'm going to take this thin strand of dubbing. And you can see this little nub of thread where I've overlapped the front edge of the abdomen, tied the wing case and the flash in. I'm going to just cover that. I'm not really going to build much bulk. I'm just going to cover it. Um, and you guys have the unique spot here with the camera over my shoulder where you'll actually be able to see this step. I do this slide in a lot of demos, and it's hard to show this step. So I'm going to line those beads up. And you can see they're kind of wedged together right now because I've just packed that dubbing in behind them. When I go to slide, get the dubbing from the back of the bead to the front, what I do is I put my fingernail against it, and I'll cross that dubbing on top in between. So see how that just tuck that wrap on top? Um, if the camera's from the other side, you can't see that because my finger's in the way, so that's a great angle for that. So I'll get a few turns in there, and then I'll do it again. And what I want to do is I want to buy myself some space here between these beads. When I first started doing these, I you know, kind of fumbled my way through all of them, and then an uncle picked the fly up, and I had to tie a bunch of samples. Um, and as I sat down to tie the samples, I figured out that I had to kind of buy that space before I went all the way forward. I couldn't tie in one set of legs and then move forward. I jammed too tight together as it went forward. So I've got to buy a little space between them. Cross back. Fill that up a bit. <coughs> I've got, oh, just a skosh more dubbing than I want here, but I can make it work. So see how you can't really see much of the beads on top, but you should be able to see them on the bottom. All right, so I'm between the, the back two beads here. And I'm going to tie in for legs. This is a, uh, a Coq de Leon hen saddle. Um, and you can see how nicely modeled those feathers are. This is the same stuff that everybody's using for dry fly tails in the, in the rooster version. But this is the hen. What was that? It's a Coq de Leon hen saddle. Um, these are from Whiting. They grow them. I'm on the Whiting, Pre Whiting Farms Pro Staff now which means I got some stickers. <laughs> it's awesome. I got, a whole, I got a whole bag. You got some stickers? <laughs> no. I really got on their pro staff because I wanted them to an actually answer the phone and send me what I wanted at the shop. Um, <laughs> and so far, knock on wood, that has worked. So... All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pull a clump of, clump of these fibers off for the tails, or I'm sorry, for the legs. Um, that's a little bigger clump than I need right there, but see how those are pulled out? They're not quite <coughs> not quite at a right angle to the stem, but see how I've got to pull them out close to a right angle to get their tip square? That's what I'm looking for there. I'm going to thin this down just a bit. About like so. So I'm going to pull that clump off sort of roll it up. I'm going to lay it here on the far side and catch it in between those beads. I get just a couple turns on it, and I honestly, right now, don't care what the length is. If it was real long, it'd be fine. One of the things I like about these Coq de Leon hens, and this one's been pretty well used up, but these are big, nice, big, long-fibered feathers. Um, so you've got a long stub in, so you can kind of change and adjust those lengths of the, of the legs and tails. Um, a regular India hen back will work, but it's a much shorter feather. So I've tied one set in there on the, on the far side. I'm going to grab the next set. 
and put it in here on the, on the near side. And I just pinch it against the hook, catch it with a couple turns. Now's where I'll worry about the length. And what I want to do here, you can also, I'm trying to think what's going to be your best angle to see this, maybe on this side. See how I can kind of pull down on those fibers or up to position those legs? Did that show? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to shorten these down. I generally say between the hook point and the barb, but there's no barb on this one, so just imagine where the barb would be if there was. And then I'll trim those stubs out. And then I'll take just a tiny bit, oh, I see my dubbing when I threw it on the floor. Tiny bit more dubbing, and this one's a tiny bit, so see what I got there? See how you can't see that? Camera doesn't even like it. That's about the right amount for a real fly. So a tiny little pinch just to cover that tie down and jump my thread back up between the front two beads. And I'll just do that leg process one more time. Everybody following along, you all got quiet as it's. Did you have cocktails beforehand? In between? Well, the second half of the show is going to be a lot of fun then. <laughs> That's why I'm not allowed to run over? We'll see about that. <laughs> That's not a challenge. <laughs> I don't blame you one bit. So you can see how those are nicely spaced, and it's not because I perfectly measured everything. It's because there's a bead between them. You can't jam them any closer together. You can also see how those legs kind of stick out at an angle. It's because they're jammed up against the front edge of that bead. If you don't put enough dubbing between those beads, you know, if you've got a, a, a yoke down between them, the legs will stick straight out to the sides. The dubbing is to fill that void between the two so those legs will kind of slope back. So I'm going to come in and trim these butt ends out. Um, you guys notice every cut I make is with the very tips of my scissors. You can actually see the, the shiny part of the tips of my scissors where that finish is worn off. Um, all, when you buy a pair of scissors, that's all you're buying is from my fingernail up, that last eighth inch of scissor blade. Um, if you're using the rest of your scissors, the rest of your blade is, of your scissors, you're, you're, you're wasting it. Um, when you make a cut, the tips of the scissors are always going to cut the closest. That's the thinnest part of the blade. Um, so see how I just made that cut? There's very little stub. I mean, you've got a big screen up there to see it. Very little stub. If I cut at the back, those blades are much wider side to side. See the width of the blade? So a narrow-tipped blade, a narrow-tipped scissor blade will cut much closer than a thicker tip. So um, I see guys, I, I watch all the same flat time videos you do, and it just, they give me cancer. Um, I just can't hardly do it. They, the guys that come in and cut way back here and leave a quarter-inch stub sticking out, I just can't hardly, hardly stand it. That's just between us, but... Um, cut with the tips of your scissors. If the tips of your scissors won't cut what you're cutting, go get some new scissors. Um, I do classes all over, and honestly, 90% of the people that I have in a class need a new pair of scissors. Um, and ideally, you should call me and buy them from me. Also, while you're at it, you don't have to, but the odds are you probably need new scissors. So now I'm going to pull this thin skin over the top, and I'm going to give it just a bit of a stretch and I'm going to drape my thread around it and then pull straight down. See how that buckled that? Okay. Get a couple turns on there. And you can see when I stretched that, see how that made that curl the other way? Now we're only going to have to fight with it for a minute. I'm going to take my flash forward and catch it with a couple turns. And I like to always look from the top again. It doesn't make any difference to the fish, but it makes a difference to me. I want to straighten that, that flash out right down the center of the wing case. If it's not straight down the center, you'll only catch fish on the left bank, <laughs> which is fine if that's where you're fishing. But when you're having a tough day, you might consider what you did there. So now to cut this thin skin off, and this is the same thing that you do on a copper john. Copper john is another fly with a thin skin wing case, uh, tied off up against the bead. If I just come in and cut that square across, there's going to be two little nubs that stick out. And everybody, and then you make 217 wraps of thread to cover it, and it's got this big wad at the front, and, and you're one of those people. Um, so to not be one of those people, what I want to do here is I'm going to make two cuts. I'm going to stretch this a little bit tight, and I'm going to cut up on the near side, and then down on the far side. So I've radius that cut so there's not near as big a stub sticking out, so I don't have to make 12 wraps of thread to, to cover it. 
Um, as for thread heads, when I build a thread head, if it's, let's say the thread head takes, you know, four turns of thread to cover whatever it is I'm trying to cover, the end of my hackle or these, these stub ends, um, if it's going to take four turns to cover it and I have room for a three wrap whip, whip finish, I really only need one turn because then I've got three wraps of the whip finish that's going to cover it all up. So in here you can see those little stubs. See them there behind the, behind the eye or behind the bead? So I'm not going to need very many turns of thread here, but I could do this with my whip finish. They screw me back in. So I'll cover those as I do my whip finish. And trim my thread out. And then I'll trim the flash. So you only do one round of whip finish and you don't do it twice? No, I don't. Um, you know, three to five turns on a whip finish and you're good. So if you think of a whip finish, um, a whip finish is a nail knot, same knot that you tie your leader to your fly line with. So think of putting two of those on top of each other. They just bundle up. It's just a, a huge knot. You know, it's, I won't say that I've never done two whip finishes. I, occasionally it happens. Um, but really, one well-tied whip finish is as strong as you're going to get. Um, one badly tied one is not going to do anything for you. But one three to five turn good tight whip finish is going to be as good as anything that you'll ever get. Um, so now, let's get to the cool part. Is our hour up yet? No. Good. How, how far in am I? 20 minutes. You oh, got good. 20 minutes Perfect. left. 20 minutes left. Oh, tell me. I'll have to tie faster. I'll have to talk less. So, are you guys on this uh, Solar Res train? Do you guys know yes. what this, this is? What do you think of Solar Res versus like Deer Valley? Uh, Deer Creek. Deer Creek. <coughs> um, all right, I, I have to. I'm going to talk for a minute, so yeah, we're going to tie it easy fly next. Um, solar Res is a UV resin uh, like Clear Cure Goo, Deer Creek Resin, uh, Loon, etc., etc. Um, about a year and a half ago, I was in California doing a program like this. I was doing a class, and there was a kid in the class um, sitting in the front row, and we tied a two-bit hooker, and, and I finished, and he came up to me, and he had a bottle of this stuff, and he's like, you know, I use this stuff for my surfboard. I don't know if it's the same stuff. You know, it's the stuff you have, and I was like, I don't know, man, let's take a look. So I take some, I put it on the desk, and I cooked it, and in three seconds, I was like, that's a thousand times better than any of the stuff they sell for fly tying. Um, and I totally thought I had the corner on the market. Like, I discovered this secret thing that's been around for a long time that nobody knows what it is. Um, I had it all planned out. I was going to buy it by the gallon and sell it. <laughs> my plane lands from California. I turn my phone back on. Ross Brunel from Fly Fisherman emails me, and I get a, a, a text from another guy that both said, have you seen the Solaris stuff? So they, in the meantime, they came up with a fly tying program. So what this stuff is originally used for, and they invented it 30 years ago, was to repair surfboards. It's a UV resin to repair surfboards. So it is, and it really does, it, it does everything that everybody says their resin does, but theirs really doesn't. Um, it dries complete, you'll see here, I'll pan this fly around, it dries completely tack free like glass. It sticks, it adheres to the fly, it doesn't come off. Um, Deer Creek is cohesive, not adhesive. Um, if you take a puddle of Deer Creek and cook it, it'll pop off your tabletop as it cures to itself. Um, and that's fine for a fly that you're coating all the way around. A lot of my flies, I just coat one side. Yeah. Um, so being adhesive makes a big difference. But What's this the name of it again, please? Solar Res. Um, so, yeah, there we go. I've been experimenting with both, and so I hadn't, hadn't decided which one I wanted. Well, I'll, uh, the other thing that I like about this is it really doesn't stink. Um, that Deer Creek has just got a terrible stink to it. Well, I, mean, I, I had a needle tip on my Deer Creek and it broke off in the threads. Well, well yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what to tell you there. So what I'm going to do here, I'll try to get this where you can see it. I'm just going to dip this needle in here. So this is the thin. That's, uh, this stuff comes in thick, thin, and flexible. This is the thin. And I use a short needle. See how my, my dubbing needle is short? I don't have a big, long, giant needle. You like holding the pencil by the eraser trying to do fine work. Um, so I'm going to sweep these legs down. I'm going to put this drop right on top of the wing case, right on that bead, right on the back edge of that bead. And you can see I can kind of bounce it. And I'll work all the way back to the base of the tails. And then when I get there, I'll sweep forward again. The reason I sweep forward again is from the old days of doing epoxy. This stuff doesn't do it quite as badly, but it can. If it strings out, you pull this big string up your tails. Um, so I always sweep back forward. And now, one of the coolest things about resin, you know, I'm, 
I'm old enough to say I'm old school now. You know, I used epoxy when it was two-part epoxy and you had a limited working time with it. Um, the cool thing with this stuff is you got all the time in the world to move it around wherever you want and get it set up just exactly how you want it. And when you get it there, cook it. So I'll give this about 10 seconds. The camera loves these lights. I'll give you another pro tip too. So whenever you take your lid off this stuff, put it right back on it. Don't, don't trust yourself that I won't, I'll put it way over here and I won't knock that over. I will find a way to knock it over. So that is our two-bit stone. See this one little strand of dubbing right here? How come nobody said anything about that earlier? So that's our two-bit stone. But you see how that's a slick fly? There's not a lot sticking off of it. Yeah. Um, these legs are soft also. That, that's another consideration that I actually kind of really went through on this fly. Um, and think about it. As a fly sinks, you know, think of a parachutist. Um, if his arms are stuck out hard, you know, rigid, it's going to slow him down. If they'll fold up, CDC, soft feathers, things like that that will fold up, will, will not slow the descent rate of the fly. Getting a fly that stays down, goes down and stays down quickly makes a huge difference. Um, I fish this fly as a dry dropper rig most of the time. A fairly long dropper, three or sometimes even four foot long dropper. Um, this fly bombs down and stays down. I fish out of the boat a lot so you're hitting pockets where you don't have time for a long drift. You have a short drift that the fly needs to get down and stay down and then pick up and go to the next spot. Um, I notice with this fly when I pick up my dry, it come, the, the nymph comes out of the same hole the dry did. Um, you know, they're not six feet apart and four inches underneath the, the surface like so many beadhead flies are. So questions on that one? Cool fly. I'll pass this around so you can see it. And it's, like I say, it's bone dry. There's How long does it take you to tie a dozen <laughs> Well, you know, I don't usually tell stories. Uh, as I I tell. Um, these, these take, I would say these flies take four minutes. Yeah, if the, you know, once I beaded the hooks, I'd say four minutes, a four minute fly. I'll let you pass that around in the dark. I guess that's not going to be much that, that helps. That's you. a low profile fly. Do you ever put that on a jig hook? Um, I have tried. The problem with that fly is uh, I'm going to probably burn up the rest of our time. You just asked the right question. Um, I like the idea of jig hooks. I, I like the idea of jig flies. The problem is, and I, Lance Egan and I go back and forth about this, um, that fly needs to be tied with the wing case on the top of the you know, it has a right side up. It right. definitely has a right side up. Um, the catch with all these Euro fishing guys, that you know, they, they all say, you know, it doesn't matter which side your wing case is on. It does to me. I don't know if it matters to the fish, but it absolutely does to me. Um, and they, you know, Lance and I go back and forth. And Lance says, you know, in the water, the fly is drifting this way. He's wrong. He's wrong. I'll just I've already told him he's wrong. He knows. <laughs> um, so that fly is really hard to tie with all those legs and wing cases on the wrong side of the hook. Could you tie it on the bottom of the hook? On the yeah, on the point side or the understanding it's going to roll when you cast it. Well, the thing is on a jig that like on that hook it'll roll, but on a jig hook they don't really roll because of that 90 degree or 60 degree 60 bend. End. They really don't roll, so they need to be tied oriented correctly. Um, and you, you know, there's a billion of them, and I, I know this is sort. Of, you asked the wrong guy, man, because I'm gonna go on forever. Um, you know, so many of those Euro jig nymphs are just simple little, like the, I, I call them like a fly that looks like nothing for a fish that's not eating. Um, you know, just stuff, shiny stuff on a hook with some red thread and some cool solar res on it. Um, yes, they catch fish, but I mean, that's not why we're here. So the salmon eggs, um, you know, there's, there's a right way to do it. Um, so I have tried to tie that, and I have done it a couple times, but it takes four times as long to get all those legs and everything on the wrong side of the hook. Um, that being said, how much time we got? Uh, 12, 12 minutes. Okay. I think I can do this in 12 minutes if I can find this hook in the dark. Um, I might answer your upside down jig question. Okay. I'll show you a cool trick that I came up with that makes this easier. Great. I think I'm violating one of my agreement rules. That, oh, that's going to make that way better. Thank you. I'm going to do this slide in the class tomorrow. But So this is your small travel bag. Well, no, this is my big travel bag. It's just not full. Yeah. Yeah.
No, they, they rifle through it sometimes, but I don't really get, get, get hung up with that. Yeah. Generally speaking, not that way. That's that's all part of our plan. Why didn't you guys tell me my eyes would get so bad when I got old? You ain't seen nothing no. yet. Because <laughs> <laughs> we don't even think about that. I've got more pairs of glasses. I used to joke that I just wore the glasses because I saw everybody else wearing them, but I can't hardly do nothing with that on these days. Well, you'll get them full time when your curiosity overcomes your vanity, you'll wear them full time. While you're doing that, you have a yeah. preference on the UV lights. Um, this is a this is a solarized UV light, but it's a, I used to use clear cure goo. Yeah, okay. um, and clear it's the cure. same light as the clear cure goo light. The, the cool thing I will say the cool thing with this they've got a like a rechargeable kit. You know, yeah. it's got a charger for the battery. Um, so instead of those thirteen dollars CR one twenty three batteries, you got a rechargeable battery. Yeah. And it, uh, you know, all those companies say like we have a special wavelength that only cures ours. Yeah. No, they don't. That's just nonsense. Yeah, um, yeah it would it would cost way more to make a light that makes one wavelength than just whatever this does. Um, the the trick to it is is the batteries are if the batteries are charged up. Um, you know, it's the same thing with that old light. If you have two new brand new batteries and it cooks that stuff in no time, if your batteries are weak, it doesn't. Um, you know, it's just like taking it out on a sunny day versus a cloudy day. Um, so the rechargeable battery made a difference for sure. And it's, yeah, so it seems like add the, in? What's that? Can you add that back in? I think you can. I think they sell just the battery and the charger. Cool. Where can I buy that? Well, Charlie, slide yeah, bottle. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a good start. <laughs> <laughs> hey. I'm working with you. Something like that. I've, I don't know where that place is. Yeah, if you, if you guys are in the Denver area, going to Arveda, there, and there's a great little uh, breakfast place like three doors down. But it's there a great is. stop. Where is it? Where'd you go? It's, a good lunch um, it's in the bl next block down. Uh, the Ag and I? Yeah. It's not there anymore. Oh, really? No. One of the cat we so we're in the old town part of part of Arvada. Arvada is sort of the new like hipster up and coming neighborhood these days, which it was not 13 years ago when we moved in. But um, so investors are just grabbing up those old buildings like hand over fist, and they that's that was in a whole corner yep. block, and they raised the, I like tripled everybody's rate because they want they need to redo the building, so they kind of they didn't throw everybody out, but if you didn't want to pay that much rent, you had to, you had to move. Um, I'm not yet. Um, you know, we, we have a lease. Our lease is good, but um, we'll see how it progresses. You know, business is commensurate with all that. It's, that's what I tell my landlord all the time. Like, you can't be the only one making money. I'm out here hustling Devin. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to show you. Yeah, a, yeah, a, 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 a like development a <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this is going to be a little bit redundant, but. I think could be could be handy for what we're doing here. Just since we just talked about um, jig flies, and this is kind of a cool trick. All right, so I'm going to get a. All right, so I'm going to tie you a jigged two-bit hooker. Okay. So it's not part of my original plan, but I'm going to I'm going to let you guys in on the secret that I haven't shown anybody else. So when everybody says, "What did you tie?" you say, "I don't remember that." I don't know what the, what the answer is there. Yeah, you should have come to the show. So.
I'm being all picky about these beads here, like it's going to make a huge difference. But, so I've got a jig bead there, a slotted bead, that I just slid on that. But this is a, a, a 400, Kimco 400, which is actually a Hanuk hook. So I've got a slotted bead and a regular tungsten bead. Okay, so a slotted and a non-slotted. And I'm going to take, and I'll type quick here because I've got now nine minutes left. I'm going to start my 70 denier red thread. Back to the bend. And that's where I'm going to tie my tail in here. Same kind of feather, just a slightly different color. This is a natural colored CDL hen. I'll pull a little clump off. So really the tying process on this, I just forgot. I want to go just a little around the bend there. So see how that tail's just slightly pointed down? I do that on jig hooks. Again, think about how the fly is going to sink hook point up. So those things that are pointing up are going to create less resistance. I'll come forward over those butt ends. Turn those out. And then I've got, I have 16 knot thread here, but 14 knot thread will work fine. And I'm going to tie this in for my rib. And just a little bit of a tapered abdomen here. It's not, not a huge amount of a taper. And then I'll lip finish that red thread. So it took me a long time to figure this little trick out, but it's going to fit really well with what we just talked about. So I'm going to use that black thread to create the rib. So I just spiraled it up the body. Nothing, this is not a hard fly at all. And I'm going to take a little bit of mahogany colored super fine dubbing. And again, you know, I like to dub it very thin but very tight. Uh, a thin strand, even on a, on a little fly, just gives you so much more ability to control the shape. So I'm going to build a ball of dubbing here behind this bead that is about as big as that bead. Maybe just shy of it, like so. And then I'm going to jump my thread, my dub thread, in between the two beads and build this up. Now, one of the catches with a jig a jig fly where you want the wing case on the right side. This fly is going to, going to drift in the water with the hook point up. So the wing case should be on this side. Okay? Lance contends that the wing case is on this side and the fly floats at an drifts at an angle. It does not. That is the whole idea of that angled hook eye. Um, all of you guys have fished a bass jig. Does it ever float anything but 90 degrees? No. It, do, it does not drift that way. That's not how that works. It's a neat idea. Nice argument. Lance is a nice guy, but he's, he's a liar. <laughs> I, I don't mean that badly at all. He's actually a wonderful guy. But. All right. So, so what we run into here on this fly is if we put the wing case on top, it's on the wrong side. And to put the wing case on the bottom, you're contending with this long hook point that will stab right into the back of your finger every time you try to tie it down. So I'll show you what I've come up with to make a really nice wing case that's super easy. So I've, I'm going to tie in legs just like we did on that, uh, on that uh, stone fly. I'm going to take a little smaller clump, obviously the smaller fly. And I'm going to divide it in half. So I've just split it in my fingers. And I'm going to set it just back to about where the barb would be. I'll pinch those in place. And I'll catch that with a loose turn of thread. So that those legs are on either side. Okay. I'm going to nip these little stubs out. And lip finish. I think this is a 14. Yeah, 14. Okay. So now I'm going to take this hook and I'm going to put it upside down in my vise. Like so.
Is there a black marker sitting in front of me? Had it a minute ago. Well, I'll show you the cool part, then I'll figure that part out. Are you just looking for a sharp chart? Sharpie will work fine, thank you. So I'm going to take <laughs> some of this solar as. And I'm going to drop it between those beads up over that dubbing. And bounce it right down the top of that abdomen to the bend. And then again, just sweep forward. And see how I can build that wing case with the resin? where it's humped on the right side of the hook. Hook that for a minute. And I, you know, I'm sort of torn. It depends on what color bead I do. See how that red bead will show through the thorax, or that brown bead yeah. will so, sort of show through. Um, so if it's a bright colored bead, I'll usually leave it. I don't color it. But if you want to color this in, you can color just the black part of the wing case. My Copic marker works, does work better than a Sharpie, just because I think more ink comes out. But you can fill that in, and then run just a hint over the top. You know, this is some, one of the cool things with resin that you would never have done with epoxy. You know, you never make multiple coats on a fly just because it takes so damn long to dry in between. So there we've got, without any holes in my finger or blood coming out of me where it's not supposed to be, um, we've got the wing case on the right side of the fly. So now when the fly drifts that way, the wing case is on the correct side. Um, so rather than even tying the wing case, and I just used the resin for the wing case. Yeah, um, cool. Super quick, and you saw how easy the fly, and I talked while I was tying the fly, and the fly's pretty darn easy. Yeah. Um, that red, I, I filled a tacky box with these in like an afternoon one day, just they, they go that quick. Um, and, and jig flies do work. They, they don't snag as much. They hook fish square in the tip of the snout. They really do work very well. Um, I don't think they're the answer to everything. I don't think they... Uh, um, fish terribly well mid-water column kind of thing, but when you're bouncing a fly down along the bottom, they're pretty pretty hard to beat. So um, I think it's time for you guys all to have a drink. I will stay here because I'm going to kind of figure out what I'm going to do next. Does anybody, before you all run off and come back, hopefully, um, anything anybody wants to see in the next round or I didn't answer or you want to think about it and have a drink and then tell me later? We'll go with that. Do you want a tiny dry fly? Oh, I, I tried a dry fly too. I mean, are you going to? Um, I actually did plan to tie one, but I ate up too much of my time. So maybe I'll start with that. Oh, I did. I also. I usually uh, been in the habit of introducing the speakers as program chairman. Uh, but Charlie got a lucky break tonight, and I'm not going to do it. Uh, but I've asked Jim Kelly if he would go ahead and introduce uh, our speaker. Thank Jim? you. Uh, Charlie gave a brief introduction uh, before we started the time section session. Uh, most of you, I think, know of Charlie. Uh, he had the fly shop in the Denver area that was the fly fishing retailer of the year uh, several years ago by American Angler. Uh, he started out tying flies when he was eight years old with a set that he was given. Uh, he said, just as an aside, as we were talking here earlier, that he's tied a million flies on this flies. Uh, he tied commercially for quite a few years. He guided on the South Platte River and then became the owner of Charlie's Fly Box in Arvada, uh, Colorado, right outside Detroit, uh, Denver. It is a. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a great shop. If you've not been there, it just makes you drool to see what they have compared to what we have available to us. If you call them, you'll find out they have real information, people that can answer questions. And the thing that, that appeals to so many of us, if you're not familiar with the part of their website that's the fly box, they have more than 200 step-by-step -step color tutorials that you can print and go step-by-step -step 
if you're working with somebody, teaching somebody, whatever, they're just absolutely remarkable. Uh, Charlie has designed a reasonable number of flies, like dozens and dozens. Uh, the Charlie Bar Hopper is a really famous one. The two-bit hooker uh, that he tied a version of it earlier. The baby gonga. Uh, if you're not familiar with a juju vitus, uh, kind of a big brother of the jujube midge. And if you fish broken bow without jujube midges, black, red, blue, shame on you. Uh, <laughs> Charlie's written several books. Uh, Charlie Craven's Basic Fly Tying, Charlie's Fly Box, uh, Nymphing. Uh, Charlie told me earlier today that he has a one in the pipeline on streamers and maybe uh, several more out over a period of time. Great, great books. Every one of them. Uh, we're really, really blessed to have Charlie. He's, he's also done a couple of uh, DVDs of saltwater fly tying and tying dry flies. Uh, He's been a contributor to many magazines. Most of us get Fly Fisherman magazine. Uh, he has a column every issue in there. There's a really great one that just came out about beauty from within. And it's just simply taking some pride in the way you do things, the way you handle thread, the way you make crafts, the way you place materials. Uh, it, it's a great, great uh, thing, and I encourage you to read them. Uh, Charlie, welcome. Well, thank you. I feel like I should be watching because this sounds like it's going to be pretty good. <laughs> uh, I, I am always unprepared for these things, so I just kind of put them together as we go. And I'll throw it out. Um, you know, I've, I've been a fly tire for a long time. I kind of threw this out before, too. Um, I'm going to tie, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, fly design and how flies fit together and how they should should work and and truthfully all flies should be designed although most of them aren't most of them are sort of happenstance or happy mistakes or um, you know my grand, granddad fished with this so I, I still fish with it um, these days there's a lot more uh, fishing success uh, with flies that are designed to do specific things and that's one of the things um, I think that's contributed to the success of my flies um, is that they're designed to do a job. Um, so we talked earlier about skinny fly, heavy flies, and getting a fly to sink. One of the things, uh, one of the big things that's really often overlooked on, on sinking flies is if you make a big bulky fly, it's not going to sink near as well as a fly that's skinnier. Um, and that boils down to the surface area, how much resistance it has as it sinks. Um, so to kind of go off of that, I'm going to go the other way and now talk about flies that float and what makes them float and what, uh, how you can build that into a fly. Um, that makes your fishing, it's not that you catch more fish, it's just that you're fishing more. Um, you know, a fly that you don't have to maintain constantly, specifically. Um, I wrote, gosh, it was somewhere in the last couple of years, an article about a, the plain old parachute atoms. Um, fly's been around forever, but it could stand some improvements. And that's one of the things that I sort of do on all of the flies that I have in my box, is I always try to find a way to improve it. Um, you know, it's not that a parachute atoms doesn't catch fish as well as it ever did. It's one of, it's, I still... I know this sounds funny because I've got 30 patterns to my name. I still fish parachute atoms almost every time I go. Um, that's still one of my favorite flies, but I have my way that I tie it. It's, it floats better. It's got better little pieces in it, just more thought out. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go through. This fly that I'm going to tie for you, this first one anyway, um, is called a Morningwood Special. Um, and I, gosh, went through 892 different variations of this fly before it got there, you know. Um, you guys, as, as fly consumers, you know, on the outside, don't see the process. And, and how, one of these days, I'm going to remember, like, from the get-go to kind of take some pictures as I go from where the fly starts to where it ends up. This fly started off just an absolute disaster and took forever. Um, and finally came out to something, you know, that I think actually looks pretty cool all said and done. Um, one of the guys at UMQA, which is the company that distributes my flies, um, Brian Schmidt at the time, he doesn't work there anymore, but at the time he said, you know, you should do a, a Charlie Boy stone fly. I have this Charlie Boy hopper that's been around for 20 years. It's a super popular fly. It sells like crazy. It works great. It fishes great. Um, pretty simple fly. He said, you should do a Charlie Boy stone fly. And I said, well, heck yeah, I'll have that for you tomorrow. So I went home that night and no, that, that's not how that worked. Um, it just didn't transfer over into a stone fly very well. So I started playing with it. And um, oddly enough, this fly that I kind of came up with is sort of where I started with the Charlie Boy 20 years ago. 
um, and went backwards the other way. So the, these two circles started at different points and ended up um, on the other ends, I guess, is, is where they came from. So I'm going to start this fly, and if you know if I get going too fast, or if you have questions along the way, just shout, holler, wave your arms. Um, I'm happy to answer whatever I can. But I'm going to start this fly not on a hook, but on a needle. This is just a sewing needle that I've got in here. And I've broken the eye off of it, not that yours needs to have the eye broken off of it. I just happened to do that by accident. But I've got the pointy end out here, and I'm going to start with some six-aught thread. So this fly is going to be a golden stone. I tied a golden stone nymph earlier. This is the golden stone adult. And, and this fly you can actually transfer over to a lot of other types of bugs. Hop, anything with that big profile. Hoppers, cicadas, um, salmon flies, squalas, all the different types of stone flies. But I'm going to start with some six-aught unit thread. And I'm just going to start the thread just up off the, the point of that, of that needle. And I'm going to leave myself a long tag end. This long tag end is going to be important. So I'm going to hang that out the back. Then I'm going to take, uh, this is fly foam. So this is about a 2 by 2 get my angle right here, about a 2 by 2 millimeter chunk of gold colored McFly foam. I call this American cheese color. It's, <laughs> it's, it's called gold. Yeah, let's look. It doesn't actually say American cheese, so don't go shopping for that. So I'm going to take this chunk and I'm going to tie it down. And here, I'll show you a little commercial tying tip because um, I have to use the same pair of scissors that I d developed this fly with. I'm going to wrap over this piece of foam so that hopefully this will show. Um, you see where it says Dr. Slick on those blades? Yeah. I wrapped to where the D is. <laughs> that's how long that is. Um, that's how they're always the same. I just use my scissors to measure. Okay. Hey, incidentally, how do you guys say measure? Measure. Measure? Not measure? No, not measure. Major. Measure. Whatever. Just like you do. I, I, I say, say major. I'm very self conscious of it now. I say yes. major. But apparently that is not right. So I'm going to measure that to the D. Um, if you don't have a pair of Dr. Slick scissors, you have to get one now. <laughs> I, I sell those also. <laughs> <laughs> I actually measured this, measured this at some point, and I can't remember if it's 10 or 12 millimeters, but it's somewhere about there. So I'm going to bind that piece of foam down, then run my thread back to the end and just fold it forward again and catch it. And what this piece of foam is going to be is sort of an underbody for our extended body portion of this fly. Now one of the things um, that's never made sense to me is little tiny extended body flies. Um, little mayfly extended body flies. They look cool. They, they do. Um, but when you've got a small bug, a size 20 bug that's you know, from head to tail a size 20, why would you make it on an even shorter hook? You know, the extended body makes sense on a big fly where you're trying to reduce the amount of hook that's in it. So it's not so heavy, it's harder, it makes it harder to float. Um, so we're going to use a different hook, smaller, slightly smaller hook, but end up with a bigger fly tied on it. So that's going to make the fly float better also. There's less hook in it. Okay? And that's why we're going with the extended body here. So I've got that underbody just tied down to the hook. And now I've got a piece of foam that is about, get my hook here. There's an ant on my table. We don't charge extra. I was thinking no the same charge thing. For that. So it's about as wide as the gap of the hook. And that's a 200 R size 8 is what that hook is. But I'm going to take this piece of foam and I'm going to poke it right through the center on the needle. Like so. Hopefully this is going to show for you all. I'm going to lift this thread up. I want to keep this thread up on the top side, and I'm going to pull that foam forward. I'm going to try to get my hands out of, my, out of your way here. So I'm going to pull my foam forward. I'm going to make the first segment here. Charlie, how about we turn the lights down for you? Oh, That'd sure, be for sure. Well, if it's better for you, it's better for me. Take a vote. I'm only kidding. Yeah, Oh. No, I can see fun. Yeah, right. yeah, I got plenty of light. That shows way better for you guys. <laughs> All right, keep your hands to yourselves. All right, so I'm going to make that first little band, and when I do, I'm going to turn this just a bit so you can see a little better here. Uh, when I make this band, I want to create the segments on this stone fly here, and I want to make about eight or ten turns there. So, see how that band of thread has created a, a wide space there. Then I'm going to lift that thread up and pull these two pieces back 
and I'm going to cross on top. Now what I want to do there, I'm going to turn that a bit so you can see it, is I don't want that thread to show here. I want it to come right through that crease. And I'll jump about a third of the way forward, pull it back together, and I always start on top. And again, the same reason. If I do it on the bottom, it's not that I can't do it from down here, but I can't control where that thread goes. I can't see what's happening underneath here, but I can see it on top. So I always start the thread on top. I'm going to make that next little segment. And then cross them back once more. And I'll come almost to the end of that foam. And create that next segment. So you can see how that's made those segments. That looks pretty yellow up there, but it's really sort of orange and brown. You can see how those segments have been created, and there's no thread showing on the crosses on the sides. Um, I've tied dragonflies the same way. You can make a nice fat dragonfly body that doesn't weigh five pounds also. So once I've got that on there, I'm just going to whip finish that thread right on top of that band. And I'll trim that thread out. And then to get this off of this needle, all I'm going to do is just grab this and pull it straight off. And I'm going to take that needle out because I will shove it right in my hand otherwise. Which isn't nearly as exciting to watch as you might think. <laughs> so now, as I pull those pieces back, you see that tag end that's hanging out? I'm going to grab that tag end and pull all that slack out. So I just tied that back in from the other end. Um, I just tied a giant nail knot all the way down the body of that fly. And I can just cut that out of there. Now I'm going to take my hook. And I've pinched the barb on this, mostly, not because I'm worried about the fish. You know, the, the, the barb doesn't really beat them up that bad. I don't really fish with barbed hooks most of the time, but I usually do leave the barb on them. So when I stick them into a foam box, they stay there. They don't come out. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to poke this point through. And the reason I pinched that barb is so that it doesn't tear such a big hole in the foam. So I did that right at the end of that little nub, right where that nub came out. And I'll slide that around the bend. And then I can chuck that up in my vise. I will tell you one thing, you know, if you've got a, a conventional vise that requires adjustment, um, those needles are much bigger than your hook's going to be, so remember to adjust your jaws. And I'll come back in with that same thread. So I just slide this back down kind of out of the way. Still on the screen. Yep. I'm going to come down just a little bit here. So I'm going to start this thread just behind the eye. And I'm going to run a thread base just back to the point on the hook. Okay. Um, see how much straight shank I've still got, or kind of slope shank at that point. Um, I don't want to come down around that bend. I'm going to try to tie like that and see if I can. If my head gets in the way, somebody whistle. Right. You can whistle, right? My head's not in the way, is it? My beard is, yeah. All right, I'm going to try to sit back. I have a very limited focal distance with these glasses, so. Um, same piece of foam that I used before, that binder strip. I'm going to tie this down just behind the eye run down the shank. And what this foam does is gives me some surface area on the hook. I'm going to glue to it and also tie the fly to it. If I just do it on bare hook, um, what, the glue doesn't adhere just to the bare metal very well. So that gives me some surface area, but it also is going to build a little diameter. You can see how fat this, this rear end got um, as I built it up with that foam inside. It just sort of chunks the body up so it matches the profile of the real bug. And I'll just leave my thread hanging back there at the bed. You can cross hatch that. It doesn't, that's not going to show. You'll see at the end here that that's not super important, other than that it's there. And I'm going to take a little bit of zapper gap and I'm going to do my best not to get this on me. But it's really not sporting if you don't have at least a little glue on your hands. So I just put a little shot there just at the bend. Don't coat the whole hook, just at the bend of the hook there. And I've got my thread hanging there at the bend. I'm going to slide this foam right up to the end with the thread on my near side and squeeze those two pieces together and I'll make the next segment just sort of equal distance to that last one. And I'll just get a few turns on it and then I want to square everything up, make sure it's straight on the hook. Because you put glue there, if you don't, if you get it crooked now, it's going to stay crooked. 
Um, and if your fly is crooked, it will still work just fine. It's just I'll make fun of you, but your fly will still work just fine. So I'm going to create that band. I'm going to pull these back again. This is just more of the same. It's a little redundant at this point, so I'll go fast. So I've made two segments on the hook there. And then one of the things you know, I talked about earlier is matching the real bug rather than matching artificial fly proportions, um, which we all have a little hard time with, you know, because when you learn to tie, you learn tails are this long and wings are this long. Um, one of the things on, on this bug, I had a real stonefly in a jar. And one of the things that struck me about it is they have a really big thoracic segment, big flat plate across their thorax. Um, so instead of just making these small segments all the way up like everybody else does, I'm going to skip about twice that far up and leave that big wide segment. to imitate that. And I'm just going to get a few turns in there. And then I'll jump the thread right up to the hook eye and then just back it off about a thread width. And this is where I'm going to build the head. So the head's going to be just a tiny little segment. Um, actually, I'm going to back up and talk about that a little bit. I could have done that anywhere along here, but I wanted to save it for the end. <laughs> like I planned it. Um, so when you tie foam down, this is a be you know tying a beetle or anything where you're tying foam down. Um, especially when you've got two chunks. Notice how I'll tighten one half down, then come around and tighten the bottom. See how that wasn't done all in one swoop? Um, let the thread just work on one piece of it at a time. Your thread always wants to twist your material. So when you've got a, especially a double thickness, um, if you tighten half and half, top and bottom, or near and far, um, if you tighten half and half, you can get a much cleaner segmentation there. See how clean those segments come out? There's no pinch. Um, it's not rolled up on one side. The thread hasn't pulled it up on my near side or pulled it down on my far side. It's because I'm a professional. <laughs> I've had a lot of practice on this one. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to cross this thread back now, right over that head segment, into that next segment back, and just let it hang there. So see where it crosses there on top? When I came up with this fly, I, I went on and on and on for a week trying to figure out what to do with this bottom piece of foam. Trying to poke a hole through it and fold it up for the head of the fly like a Charlie Boy Hopper. And, um, God, I had 219 different variations on the theme before I finally figured out that if I just grab it and pull it down, and give it a little stretch and cut it off, it bleeds, oh, get my head out of the way, it bleeds right into the rest of the foam. So the easy answer is always the answer. Don't make it harder than it needs to be. All right, so now I'm going to put some legs in. So for the legs, these are, uh, these are called sexy legs. This is uh, flexi floss or super floss. Um, that's barred with a marker. You can buy it this way or you can just buy it plain and bar it yourself. Um, either way, you should buy it from me. <laughs> since, we're, since we're on that train. Uh, so I'm going to take this first leg and I'm going to put it in here on, on my near side. Try to get my face out of the way. And catch it right along the seam in that foam. Just with a turn. Okay. Everything from here on is going to be kind of cumulative wrap. So I don't need four or five turns over anything because they're all going to end up with four or five turns over them as, as it's all done. So just a turn there, and I'll cross back over the top and catch it in that second segment with a couple turns. So he's tied in along that near side. Doesn't really matter which, which order you do it in. Then I'm going to take another leg and catch it on that far side. Cross forward and catch it again. Seems simple, yeah? Yeah? Yeah. 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 Seems. For a pro, yeah. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> so those back legs I trimmed just short of the end of the body. Um, and the reason I, that, that's actually an important measurement. If you leave those legs much longer, they will catch underneath the, the hook barb or the hook bend when you fish, and you're constantly untangling those legs. There's a very fine line of how long those legs could be before they become cumbersome. These front legs I'm going to trim about that same length. The front legs don't tangle as much, but about that same length. So we've got just kind of a big X on top. Already starting to look pretty hoppery, stonefly-y. Um, one of the things that struck me on most commercial flies, and this is, the, you know, I cautioned earlier for the, everybody that was here earlier, um, about following a, you know, a, a pre-made pattern, somebody else's fly pattern, um, versus looking at the bug. One of the things I notice when I'm out fishing, when I see stoneflies on the water, and two for that matter, um, very rarely are they laying on the water with their wings laid flat over their back like they're happy to be there. Um, those pictures that you see in the magazines are all taken in somebody's backyard um, with the, you know, the bug sitting on a bush and he's happy and he's, you know, he's sitting like he should be. 
When they're in the water, their wings are usually flailing. They didn't land there on purpose. They generally don't want to be there. Um, so I wanted to make a fly, a stonefly specifically, that had spread wings, wings that were spread out like they were fluttering. Um, and the big salmon flies particularly, they look like a butterfly on the water. They're just a ball of, a ball of buzz is what they look like. So for the wing material, originally um, I had used McFlylon. And McFlylon will work wonderfully for it. You just go through it quickly. Um, and then Umqua made for me some stuff that they called Umqua Stonefly Wing, which is a beautiful material. It's multicolored. Um, it's kind of a coarse material like this. Um, it had multicolor and flash in it, but it's not polypropylene. Um, and I'll tell you now, if, you're, if you make wings on any of your dry flies with a material that is not polypropylene, it's not going to float as well as if it was. So Antron, Zelon, Darlon, all of those materials will sink. Okay? They all absorb some water. Uh, polyar, polyar, polypropylene, is the only thing that you got out there that will float. So McFlylon or regular old polypro. Um, what I finally came to, this is polypropylene macrame yarn, like you'd use for a strike indicator. Um, it's about six bucks for a hundred yard spool of it. Um, it la so it lasts forever. So what I've done here is I've taken, you can see I've just melted that in and kind of bound it up. And I just brush this out with a, with a dog brush. Okay, the, the nappier you can get this, the better. See how curly that is? Um, just like a yarn indicator, that's going to give us surface area. That's what makes the fly float. The foam doesn't make the fly float so much as it keeps it from getting soaked. Um, that's one of the things I talk about with Parachute Adams, the, the dubbing is the liability on that fly. A dubbed body is a liability, especially as you start catching fish. Have you ever noticed as you're out fishing, if you're not catching fish, you're, you have no problem keeping your fly floating? Like you don't have to fight to keep your fly dressed and dry when you're not catching fish. It's when you're catching fish that the fly gets wet. And it's because your fly holds fish slime. So you've got to get all that out of there. So a fly that is non-absorbent of that stuff, um, will float better than a fly that, that is, and dubbing always is, no matter how tight you put it on there, it always is. So I'm going to take a clump, a fairly small clump of this poly, about like so, and we're counting on the curl. This is, this is something, um, you all know what a chubby Chernobyl is, yeah? Um, terribly designed fly. It's got way more material on it than it needs to. Um, that fly, you know, you see how big, the, big and heavy the <coughs> wing on that is. The surface area, think of surface area. Think, think of the surface area of a parachute hackle. Um, you know, parachute hackle is, is wrapped on end. So the surface area of one wrap really is the same as the surface area of ten wraps. It only touches on the bottom. Um, that, that chubby wing is the same thing. It, you know, if it's an inch wide, it doesn't need to be two inches tall. It could be just, just an inch wide. That's the part that's going to make the fly float. So we don't need a ton of material here, which also makes the fly much easier to cast. Okay. So I'm going to take this sparse clump, and I'm going to lay it here in this head segment and catch it with two wraps. And really what I like to say that I'm going to do here is I'm going to tie bad spinner wings. So if I was tying a rusty spinner and I wanted, uh, and I wanted to do it right, I would make a nice tight X in the middle here. What I'm going to do here is I put two turns, and then I'll angle this back and catch it with two more so that these slope backwards. You can actually see that X right there of the thread right in here. So see how those are sloped back? That's going to give us a lot more surface area than if we just put one wing flat over the back. So I'm going to lay those in and then I just pull down tight on it. See how that will cinch into the foam and kind of stand those up a bit? What that's also going to do is make the floaty part of the fly let the body sit down in the water where the fish can see it. The footprint of the fly is way more important than people give it credit for. A fly that sits low, that's why foam flies work so well, is they sit low in the water. They do float well, but they sit low. They make a big footprint. The fish can see them easier. And then just sort of in a nod to the flash that Uncle had put in that, that original wing, this stuff is ripple ice fiber, and this is a blue UV color. So, And it's really just the UV that I'm after. I don't need a ton of it. I want to take about... I don't know, probably 10 or 12 strands. I'm going to say that's 10 or 12. And I'm going to lay this in the same way. Right up on top. So it's just up on top of the wing. So see how sparse that looks on the screen? On the water, this slide looks like it has a light bulb in it. 
it's amazing how visible that little bit of flash is. So keep that in mind when you're tying small parachutes. One strand of flash in the wing makes it show up 50 times better. Um, way better than I ever imagined it would, just that little bit of flash. So little pieces like that. Don't go crazy with it. Um, I'm the same way, I mean, it, you know, as everybody else. When I was a kid, I used to, if, it, if a little was good, a lot was better. I remember the first package of crystal flash I bought, I think I used it up in a day. I put it on everything. Um, a little is good, a lot is not always better. So salt and pepper, just a little touch. So I'm going to put that right on top. This one out of here. And then I'm going to put an indicator in. Originally on this slide, I actually wrote an article about this slide um, using some pink McFly line for the little indicator on top. Uh, this fly seems like it shouldn't need an indicator. It's, you know, it's an inch and a half long and it's yellow. Um, the catch being is if you're, if you're wade fishing, out of a boat it's not hard to see because you're above it. Um, when you're wade fishing, there's not a whole lot of, you're not getting a front angle there, but you know, there's not a whole lot of profile to this fly. So um, originally I tied it with some McFly line and then last year my wife and I went up to Cody, Wyoming and I had tied just a few with um, a little loop of razor foam, pink razor foam. And the razor foam shows up significantly better, and it's because it's opaque. It's not translucent. It doesn't let the light through it. It shows up on top. And I can con kind of contain this to the top of the fly. So I'm just going to set that little loop just back to this first segment, right up on top, and catch it with a couple turns. And again, see if I start to, if I go to just kind of keep wrapping on this, that foam's going to want to roll. So what I've done is pinched it in there, and I'll just pull straight down. See how it stayed on top? One of the things you contend with with foam versus a bare hook is whenever you tie something down, it's going to get creased into a notch. Um, so everything's going to want to either roll or twist. Um, you just have to make that part work for you. So I'm going to cut that stub end out. A little stub of flash right there. And to make the head, I'm going to cross this thread to the center of that head segment. There's my face again. I feel like you guys miss me every now and again, so I just put it up there so you remember who I am. <laughs> so I've just crossed the thread to the center of that head segment. No one's whistling now. Yeah. I'm going to slide that front piece back and catch it with two turns. Okay. I'm going to keep my thread up so that I can let go of this leg on this near side. Let it come back forward. And then cross the thread right back up to the indicator and fold it down again. So there's our big fat salmon fly thorax on top there. And see how we've got that big wide profile out of that? Um, like I say, this fly, all flies, you know, well-designed flies, when they're, when they're all said and done, seem perfectly obvious. It's getting there that's the hard part, so. I felt dumb when I finally got to the end and it was the easy answer, because it's always the easy answer. I should know by now. So I'm gonna cut that, actually, no, I'm not. I'm gonna whip finish first. For some reason, if I whip finish right here with this piece of foam long, um, it goes much better than if I cut it off first. I have no idea why because I don't pull on it, but I'm just going to whip finish through that segment. Just three turns. Pull that down tight and then trim my thread out. Then I'll cut that piece off. I'm going to take my wings and trim them. Try to keep my hand out of the way here. Just short of the end of the body. So see how little wing is there? You, yeah, there you got a good angle on how that flash is going to light up. So it doesn't take much wing, but look how much surface area comes out of that wing. That flies three times as wide as it was before, um, but much, much easier to cast, even than a chubby. Now, one of the things on this fly right here is kind of where it was done, um, and I can, can never leave well enough alone. You know, I come up with the fly, and I set it in one of these fly hooks, and I set it on my desk, and I stare at it for a week. Um, and one of, the th one of the problems with this fly, in my mind, is it's got four legs and stoneflies have six legs. And I couldn't figure out where to get those other legs in there. Um, and then literally one night in the middle of the night I remembered how I used to do bass bugs, how to put legs on bass bugs. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to try to make this so you can see it. This is a bobbin threader, just a wire bobbin threader. I'm going to take it and push it in this big wide segment here we did at the front. And I want to go under the hook. push it through. I went through the foam. You're all at rapt attention. You're assuming that trout can camp, aren't you? Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> if it was just about trout, you guys wouldn't be sitting here. 
Oh, so Bass can can can't man. I didn't know that. Well, if it was, you know, valid point, valid point for sure. I, I mean, I won't argue with it about that. But um, one of my big things, there we go. One of my big things is trout eat salmon eggs and worms and chicken livers and things like that. It's not just about catching fish. I mean, no, you all aren't sitting here on on Monday night after work after a long day at work to find out how to catch trout. Um, it's about doing it right, you know. It's, it's and and. I put eyes on a lot of my flies. People ask me all the time, do you think trout care if they have eyes? No, they don't, but I do. Um, it's, it's for me, absolutely, you know? Well, you also can accumulate more equipment this way. Of course, of course, that's half the battle. <laughs> Which could be uh, purchased where? You, you can purchase any of that equipment <laughs> that you may need. And if you want to put eyes, I have four or five different kinds. So I just thread that through, and then I'm going to take one of these other legs, or strands, and thread it through the end of that threader and then just pull that back through. So wow. now I've got six legs. That's great. Now, the catch here, um, you could cut these off to, to length and they would never come out when you fish them. I, I fished them that way for, for a long time. But when the fly goes in the bin, everybody comes up and goes, oh, look how they get that leg in there, and they pull on it. So here's how to make that leg not come out. I'm going to pull it long through on one side. And I'm going to put just a little shot of zappy gap on it. And then I'm going to pull that zap back into the foam, like that. And if you give it a little pinch there on that segment, you now also glued that segment down to that foam that was underneath it. No, ideally you didn't get enough glue to glue it. I, I'm doing pretty good. I don't have any glue on me, knock on wood, yet. So now I'm going to trim those legs same length as the others. This one seems long. And now again, in a fit of nothing better to do, you can absolutely fish this fly this way, but you'd be, you'd be boring. So I'm going to take a black marker first. Um, golden stones are really a very pretty marked bug, so I'm going to put some bands up the sides here, right on the edge of that foam, on both sides. I'll try to keep my face out of the way again. You see, I just run that up that edge, and then one right down the center. And then the same thing on the head. These are uh, Copic markers. They have a, I saw that. Uh, that's called a watercolor tip. Uh, so it's kind of a flexible little soft tip, and depending on how hard you push, you can get a little narrow. You can see how small it gets. Um, these are really nice markers. They're expensive, but they are, they really are nice markers. And do you sell those? I do. <laughs> Thank you. Name again? Uh, Copic is, the, is Copic. the brand name. They're an art marker. Aren't they the kind you paint rocks with? Paint what with? Rocks. I, I suppose you could. I, I've not been painting any rocks just lately, but if I were gonna, I would probably use these. Um, and now, because I got the marker in my hand, I'm gonna put some little eyeballs on them. So just a little dot. Stoneflies do have dots for eyes. Hoppers don't. So just a little dot on either side, because now your fly knows where it's going. <laughs> and kind of fan those wings back. So you can kind of see the hop. You know how that would transfer over to a hopper pretty well, also. Um, but lots of surface area without a ton of material. We're only talking about one dimension of the fly to make the fly float. It doesn't need to be tall, it doesn't need to be long, it just needs to have surface area. Um, you know, three wraps on a parachute is plenty of surface area. We've got, let me turn this just a bit up here. All that surface area on the bottom of that fly without a whole lot of material. So much easier to cast. And that's, that's sort of my idea on designing flies trying to get everything I can out of it without using 50 pounds of materials. Um, sure. I'm sure you've seen all you know the 8 million different articulated streamers that everybody's tying these days where it's got you know a scoop of mashed potatoes and a wool sock and a, um, you know that, that kind of stuff just drives me bananas. You have some thought about it. Um, it's not it, it's not hard. I mean go cast one of those things for half a day and, and you'll find out that they all need to be skinnier. There needs to be less material on them. Um, and this is kind of the same same boat. Uh, you know a lightweight fly that doesn't have a ton of material on them. Also, in the dry fly version, it's going to float better. All right, so we're all super impressed with that. There you go. That's great. I'll let you pass that. Well, I'll let you pass it. I don't know if you can see it. Okay. It came out pretty good. I haven't tied one of those in a few days. Charlie, what do you use as leg materials as opposed to just using rubber? Um, the reason I use <coughs> the, the question was what 
why do I use that material instead of regular rubber legs? Rubber legs dry rot um, fairly quickly. Um, and, and that's both from a you know standpoint of my box. I tend to, like when I, you guys probably do the same thing. Like if I go out and catch a bunch of fish on that fly, I go home that night and I tie a pile of them. Um, not that I'll ever need them. I, have, I, I could not tie a fly for the rest of my life and I'd never run out. Um, but I go home and tie a pile of them. So maybe three years from now I need them again. And if the legs dry rot and fall off, then I wasted all that time. The other part is, is when they sit in a bin, you know, when they're, when they're tied overseas and they sit in a bin somewhere, I don't want them to fall apart there either. So that, that spandex elastic, which is what that is, um, holds it, it does dry rot, but it takes about 10 years for it to dry rot versus one year. So. <coughs> all right, I'm going to show you another dry for a caddis that, that goes right into our surface area program. Any, any other questions while I'm digging this other stuff out? Can you tell us what you do with your atoms? Just oh, briefly. yes. Um, so what I do with my atoms is, you know, same hackle fiber tail, brown and grizzly hackle fiber tail. I use a biot for the abdomen, a goose biot. Um, and I use, it's a wild Canada goose biot. And if you know somebody that hunts geese that kills northern geese, greater Canada's rather than lesser Canada's, you can get biots that are long enough to tie a size 14. Um, a lesser Canada, which is what is most common, like we've got 50 billion of them in Colorado. If you ever need any, just come up and drive through a park. Um, there's a billion of them up there. But the lessers are totally long enough for a 16, but to get a size 14, you need a greater Canada. Um, but they've got a, a dark edge. Let's see if this will show up up there. See the dark edge on that biot? So they make a beautifully segmented body. I make, I, and I wrap a smooth body, not a ribbed body. But I wrap them smooth um, because the mayfly doesn't have ribs. It doesn't have stand-up ribs. Um, and there's some different schools of argument on that. You know, the stand-up, like a turkey bite with a stand-up edge does create more surface area. So that fly will float a little better because it's got a little more surface area. But it's not as accurate. The reason I use the biot is because it does not get saturated with fish slime. You know, and McFly on for the wing and the hackle in the right place. You know, there's a few other pieces to it. What do you use? And speaking of that, what is the material you use for the wing? McFly on is what it's called. Um, it's uh, hairline sells it. It uh, it's heat treated polypropylene. So reg conventional polypropylene has been around for a hundred years. Um, is like a matte finish. It's a flat white or flat whatever color, um, and it doesn't show up as well. And because it's not heat treated, it sticks to itself. It mats together. Um, the disadvantage to that is as you fish the fly, if you've tied polypropylene wing spinners or, or parachutes, you fish it for uh, an hour and you have a little ball on top of the fly. It just knits down into a ball because that wing sticks to itself. Uh, McFly line is slick, so it doesn't stick to itself. It holds its shape a lot better. Uh, but that heat treat also makes it a little bit shiny so that it shows up better. Um, and again, just that little bit of flash that's in that wing makes that, that fly show up so much better. Just that extra bit of shine, it's not, and it sounds funny when I say it, but I, every time I've been fishing with somebody and I tell them this, um, the white of that wing, even on a white foam line, is a different color white, so it shows up a lot better. It's just, it just sticks out, um, and it doesn't get matted, it doesn't, doesn't soak up water, it doesn't get slimed. It's much easier to maintain. I fish a lot out of a boat on fairly fast moving rivers, the Colorado, the Eagle, the Arkansas. Um, so if you're having to pull your fly in and dry it off and dry shake it and puff it up and blow on it and wipe it off and all that, it's you waste you just wasted 50 yards of river. Um, so my idea is to keep your fly in the water. You know, no matter what fly you fish with, as long as it's in the water. Um, so a fly that requires less maintenance to keep it floating is going to catch you more fish than even a better fly that you're managing all the time. And and I think I've proven that over and over again with the parachute atoms. I mean, it's the most generic thing on earth, but if you keep it in the water, they'll all eat it. They'll, every one of them will eat it. And what do you use for post on that, that poly? It, it's line? called McFly Line. McFly Line is the... It's a brand name. Um, I'm trying to think of it. They, they make McFly Foam and McFly Lawn. Let's see what the name of the company is. It's probably mixed something. Uh, McFly Foam Products. It's the company that makes it. That's, that's the brown, you know, brown and orange color. You know, it lo it looks like poly. It looks it looks like Antron Zila and Darwin. It's just made out of polypro. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I need an assistant to put all my pieces. Away. So this next line I'm going to tie for you is a 
I don't think this fly even existed the last time I was down this way. Um, this fly is called a screaming banshee, and this is one of my favorite flies uh, to tie and fish, honestly, both. Um, this is tied as a skating caddis pattern. See how close I have to be with these glasses to actually see anything. Charlie, what's a uh, antron made out of if it's not polypropylene? Antron is made out of antron. Um, an Dupont antron. It's carpet fibers. Is what antron is. And antron is specifically made not not to stick to itself, so it doesn't mat as a as a carpet fiber. Um, so, like if you've used antron dubbing, you've noticed it's hard to dub and it's really slick. That's because it was designed to do that. Um, and frankly, it's a terrible dubbing. Um, you know, it's the worst stuff in the world to use. It comes in bright colors, is what saves it. That's why everybody uses it. Um, but it's terrible stuff for, uh, uh, you know, actually trying to trying to dub onto a hook. Uh, but yeah, Antron is is slightly absorbent. It's like 1.2 percent of its weight in water. It'll it'll hold. It's more absorbent than Xenon, Is that right? Uh, you know, I don't I don't know relative to to one to the other. But I know none of those are polypro. You know, Antron, Zeland, Darlon are not polypro. I thought I had some green dubbing in here, but we might just tie a brown one. We're going to call that brown. All right. I just made an executive decision for all of us. All right, so this one is a skating caddis pattern. And I came up with this fly five years ago last week. Um, really? I know this because at that point my wife and I were getting married and we had just bought a house. So in the process of moving my house and her house to our house, I had a box of magazines. You know how you have that box of magazines that you never get rid of? I, I moved this box 50 damn times. Up the stairs, down the stairs, out of my house, into her house, into the moving truck, into the new house, downstairs, upstairs. And on the top of this box of magazines was an old, I, I'm not even sure which fishing magazine it was, but an old fishing magazine. And on the back back of it, it had a, a old steelhead fly called a moose turd. Um, it was a skating fly. Yep. Um, so a moose turd has is made out of moose hair, and it's got a forward-facing wing um, to skate the fly. And I moved this box so many times, and I, I just was looking at the fly one day. I remember I was on the stairs, and I said, I wonder if I could tie that tiny like a caddis and make it skate like that big fly does. You know, these flies are this big. Um, so I had this fly in my mind for a month while we moved in. And all my tie stuff was packed away, so I didn't have a chance to do it. And this is one of the, you know, I just told you how everything kind of takes forever to get to. This is one of the only flies I've ever had the idea in my head. I sat down and tied it the first time, and it was exactly what I thought it was going to be the first time. Um, so there's that. It'll never happen again. So. so it's not an entirely original design. I just came up with a different application for it. What is it called? It's called a Screaming Banshee. And I've tied it for caddis and for yellow Sally stoneflies, just altering the color. So I'm going to tie this on a uh, 2487, so a curved shank hook. This is a 14, yeah. Get all this junk out of your way here. So you pretty much use your threaders just to stick Stuff the phone, yeah, I don't really. Well, box. so also this is this is a new bobbin from Tiemco. This is a Tiemco fine tip double arm bobbin. Um, so that tube is very small. That threader actually won't fit through there. Um, one of the cool things about this bobbin, though, is that tube is adjustable. So I can make it real short or real long. I prefer it longer. I'd actually like it to be just a little bit longer yet. Um, and there's. You know, th this is not a selling skill. I, I, you know, I own a fly shop, and like nobody pays me to say these things. Um, this has become my favorite bobbin. They gave me the first prototype of this bobbin, and I tied with it for like a month, and it has become my favorite bobbin. It feels a lot more precise to me than the other bobbins, which I've used for years. A standard straight ceramic Kiyoko bobbin I've used for years. Um, 
I've sold a million of them. I have 25 of them. Um, there's no reason this should be any more precise than they are, but it feels like it is to me, so I like it. There's there's my opinion of it. Um, I, I really like the rights or stuff. No, um, I, the the right bobbins I don't like because they're not symmetrical. They've got just one arm. Um, so I spin my thread a lot because I tie left-handed. So when I spin my thread, they don't spin smooth. Um, these still do. Um, and part of this is, you know, I, I tell people this all the time. I've tied with really the same batch of tools for years and years and years. So anything different is pretty hard for me to make a change to. Um, now, that being said, um, here's a great example. Uh, rotary hackle pliers for parachutes. The, the Tiemco Umpqua rep 20 years ago gave me a pair of these and I was like, oh, those are cool. And I stuck them in my tool block and I never used them for 10 years. And then one day I tried them and was like, huh, you're an idiot. You should have been using these the whole time. Um, but, you know, try some new stuff every now and again. It, a lot of times it does work. Um, those little Jorgensen hackle tweezers are another good example. These little guys. Um, that's the best hackle plier that's ever been made anywhere on earth, hands down. Um, there's a little old guy from Cascade, Colorado. He's a retired engineer. Came in my shop one day. He talks about this loud. That's about as loud as he ever gets. And he came in, and I was I was tying an order of flies, and he came over and he said, Charlie, I have a I have a hackle plier I made. I'd like to give you one. And, and I was like, Oh, thanks, you know. And I took it and I set it over in my tool block and didn't use it for weeks. And then one day I was tying some flies. I was wrapping biots, and I which wrapped the biot, and the hackle pliers fell off and rolled across the table, out of reach. So I reached over and grabbed his and. Yeah, they're the best hackle pliers I've used. So I'm getting better about at least trying to do stuff. Um, but, you know, we're all stuck in our ways, you know, what's, what's comfortable for us. Yeah, I, I, you know, I would say, you know, a right bobbin feels clunky to me, but there's plenty of people that love them. Um, you know, how you get it on the hook is up to you. What feels good to you. Could you talk a little bit about hook substitution? Um, for this hook? Specifically, or in general, I mean, when when do you play around? I mean, um, we don't have two hundred different. Well, not yet. Well, <laughs> not yet. We don't have two hundred. Yeah, I'm fairly opinionated on that because there's a lot of cheap hooks in the world, and there's a reason they're cheap. They're not. They're generally not forged or tempered. Mm -hmm. um, so cheap hooks are cheap for a reason. So I don't tie anything on cheap hooks. Okay. Um, I have always tied. This is long before I was an Umqua tire. Um, I've always tied, all my commercial flies were always tied on TMCO hooks, and I still to this day will, will hold fast that TMCO makes the best hook there is. Um, no, no two ways about it. There's nobody else that's even close. Daiichi makes good hooks. Gamakatsu makes good hooks. They don't have the range of sizes and shapes and styles. Um, a lot of the import hooks are reasonable. I'm more into like size substitution and shape substitution. Like that. Oh, you, you, you don't, don't have what it looks like in the picture. Um, Something close. Yeah, so, so it depends on who tied the fly, you know, because I, I substitute different hooks for other people's stuff all the time. Um, my stuff, I think, is pretty well thought out. You should just do what I said. Um, <laughs> but that, but and you know where I'm yeah, I, uh, Well, I do. But, but the, the point being is, is, like, if the fly is designed, it's generally designed around a hook. You know, if it's a standard dry fly hook, any standard dry fly hook will do the job. Um, the reason I want the curve, and you'll see when I finish this fly, the shape of the overall fly. The reason I tied this fly on a curved hook is I wanted the butt end to sit down in the water so it pushes the front end up so it will skate. Um, so that's why I used the curve. Um, you know, that, a, a handily good question that you ask, um, 2488, which is the same hook with the ring eye, doesn't work as well because the hook eye sets with the knot, sets the hook in the surface film at the right angle. My mole fly is a little... Uh, Mayfly emerge, super simple little Mayfly emerger. Same story. Down eye hook makes the hook sit in the water. So if this is my water line, let me turn this a little. Makes the hook sit like that, you know, to the water line, so the hook hangs down. With a ring eye hook, you, because your tippet's going to hold up the front end, it's going to sit that way, so it doesn't sit as far down. So the angle of the hook, it, uh, you know, affects how the hook sits in the water. The angle of the hook eye. Um, so it, it it depends on you know if the hook was part of the design or if it was just happenstance. All right, so I'm going to take this is uh, this is Simperfly actually, which is a GSP thread. They call it 12 watt. They all lie. Um, it's 50 uh, yeah, see 50 denier. That's what you're looking for. Um, I don't love this stuff in general, and, I, and generally I, I've tied this fly, I mean, for years with, with ADOT unit thread, nothing special. Um, 
the, I tied a big order in this uh, for a friend of mine. His company wanted flies to give away at this trade show, and I had to tie them in his company color. So he ordered like 300 of them, and I had to tie them all up. Um, so in that process, I started using this GSP thread because uh, I had sort of a less than great chunk of deer hair. So um, you don't have to use GSP, but I've got it here handy, so I'm gonna. And this is olive, but it's barely going to show, so it doesn't make a huge difference. So I'm going to start that thread, and with this GSP, I have to make kind of a long jam knot. Um, GSP thread, gel spun polyethylene is what that's made out of. Super strong, very slick, hard to cut. Um, <coughs> with this GSP thread, I have to make a long jam knot so it doesn't pull off. And then right here behind the hook eye, I'm going to build a little thread head, first thing. Right up behind the eye, and then just back the thread behind that. Turn that just a bit. So see how we've got just a little nub, just like you'd finish off a fly at the end. Now to make the forward facing wing, we're going to cover a few different bases here. I have no idea what kind of time we're looking at. I'm, I'm already open. You guys weren't going anywhere, were you? Nah. Exactly. You're good. So this is yearling elk. All right. See how straight that hair is? Um, that's half the battle with any kind of hair fly, is finding a good chunk of hair. Um, it, may, it makes a gigantic... I cannot tie a good fly without a good chunk of hair. Um, and neither can anyone else. No matter how good they are, you can't get around a bad chunk of hair. Um, so this is, this is yearling elk, which is not as coarse as cow or bull elk. Um, there's a lot of differences between those hairs. I won't get into all that now, but um, this is a fairly soft hair that flares nicely. And this is a nice straight chunk. So I just cut this clump off. Let me get it up here where you can see it. I just cut it off the hide. And what I'll do here, try to keep my hands up here. And this is on any hair fly, elk or caddis, humpy, any, anything that you're tying with, with elk hair. I'm going to hold that hair as close to the tips as I can get it. Um, you don't want to, when you go to clean this hair out, you don't want to hold it halfway down and try to pull all this stuff out. You've got to get all the way up to the tips, as close to the tips as you can get. And I kind of just spread it out in my fingers a bit and then pull all that junk out. So see all that short stuff that came out? See how that hair is finer than what I have in my fingers? So you're not just trying to get this dubbing fur, under fur, out. You're trying to get all that short hair out too. See how wispy those tips are? That hair is not the same diameter as, or hardness as this hair is. So we want to get this out. That's where you get, you know, you pull down as hard as you can and the hair's not all flared. It's because you've got 50 different size ball bearings in there. You want them all the same size, the same hardness, same texture. So I want to clean all of that out. And if I had, I don't really, but if I had anything extra long, I would pull those out too. Those are extra long. And then I'll take my hair stacker. So here's the trick on a hair stacker. I do shows all over. And every one of those shows, there's some guy that sits there all day doing this as loud as he can for as often as he can all day. You do not ever need to pound on your hair stacker. If you clean the hair out and the hair is reasonably straight, if you tap it a few times, the hair is straight as an arrow. Okay, it doesn't take a lot. What I do like to do, is that one long one? When I trying to figure out where I can show this. So when I stack, I put my finger on the edge of the tube and then I'll tap it. Don't cap your finger over the end. This hair's sticking out, so I couldn't do it anyway. But if you cap your finger over the end, you'll make suction and the hair pulls back and up. So you can pound it all you want and it doesn't come out. So I'm going to just give that a few taps. Now see how that hair is sort of in a sheet, sort of in a big clump? I'll then take that clump of hair and once I've got it stacked, I have a better idea of how much I have kind of thin it down to the right amount. And the right amount I know because I've done this before. And that's, you know, it's a hard thing I, in class. Everybody says, how much hair do you need? And I can say, there's, there's 117 there. That doesn't do you any good. Um, you, you have to kind of play, it, and it will vary from chunk of hair to chunk of hair. So then I'll take that same clump, and without doing anything, I just still stacked. I'm going to put it in my small stacker and give it a few taps. So my small stacker is just a smaller diameter tube. But see how that hair is now bundled into a nice little clump? so I don't have to pinch it together in my fingers. It just regroups it into a little bundle. Can you guys see that one broken tip right like two-thirds of the way up? Yeah. So if you're fishing and you have a fish come up and look at your fly and turn away, it's because of that. So get those out of there as best you can. Are you sure they're not counting legs? 
Well, they could be, but if I mean, if there's a broken tip, you're not. They don't get to the counting part. <laughs> there's that ant. I was telling you about him. I told you. He wants to be part of the flood. He he may well end up part of the flood. I got it. Yeah. I have tried to get a hold of it. I just trimmed my fingernails and I can't even get a hold of it. But it's got to come out. There it goes. All right. So um, once I've got this stacked up, nice and clean and neat, I'm going to take and measure this about a shank length long. Now, people always ask me, how did you just hold this clump of hair up and get it exactly the right length right when you held it up there? Um, I didn't. So. I'm going to turn this just a bit so you can see this angle. See how I can roll my fingers back and forth? So see how long that hair is? And then I can roll my fingers forward to make it a shank leg long. Um, all I'm doing is opening and closing my fingers here. So that's where that measurement comes from. You know, I get it up in the ballpark when I put it in my fingers, but I'll measure it as I go up. Um, now I've been talking, so my thread's kind of spread out a bit. I'm going to twist it up just a bit. I'm going to go a shank leg long here. I'm going to set this hair on top. I'm going to put one turn, next turns right behind it. Okay? I'm now going to tighten the thread toward me. There's a lot of schools of thought on this. Pull your thread up, pull your thread down, pull your thread, wrap your thread around the hair. Um, this is the only way to do it right. Everybody else does it wrong. <laughs> um, so I put two turns around there. I'm going to tighten the thread toward me, just toward me. All I did was tighten it. I didn't move the thread. I just pulled it toward me. The thread started on the near side of the hook. It went around the hair two times, and I closed that loop by pulling it toward me. If I pull down, it's going to roll that hair to the far side. I can't let go of these buttons because they'll roll, but um, that's what I'm going to do to get my flare. This is the same thing I do on a humpy or an elk hair caddis. It's all the same move. Then I'm going to wrap backwards, making a band of thread. So I'm going back toward my fingertips here. And it might be 12 or 15 turns, like so. And that hair is all up on top of the hook. See, when I pull on the thread, the hair is not moving. There's no more flare in the hair. Um, if you think, and I, I talk about this all the time, if you think of elk hair or deer hair as hollow like a straw, it's not. Uh, it's more cellular, but it, if you think of it like hollow like a straw, um, there's an inside diameter and an outside diameter and a wall thickness. All those things need to be considered. Um, when you're compressing that hair, what you're trying to do is take that hair from round to flat. That's what you've got to do is get all the hair flattened with those first few turns. You can't make two loose turns and then make five tight turns on top of it because you did not compress them with the first two. You have to crush the hair with the first two turns, then continue from there to bind the hair down so it doesn't move when you pull on it. Okay, no more flare at all. So now these butt ends that I've got back here are more than I need for the hump part of this fly. So I'm going to cut off about 75% of them. Throw that on the floor. So now I'm going to hold on to these butts. And just sort of in open spirals, I'm going to work down around the bend of this hook. And you can see where the, the curve of this hook is coming in on this pattern. Uh, I do tie a version of this on a straight hook called a Nyx. Any like big Greek mythology buffs? Nobody knows what a Nyx is. I had to look it up too. It's like a banshee. All right, so I just moved that hair down the bend. And I'm going to take some Mirage Tinsel, because I use Mirage Tinsel in almost everything. Um, Mirage Tinsel picks up the colors around it. Um, so while it seems shiny, it gives you a little sparkle, but it's not overbearing. But again, it's, you know, a salt and pepper thing. So I'm going to catch this just behind those butt ends with a few turns of thread. And then I'm going to wrap backwards going down the bend here. and then forward again, so I get a double layer body. I'll unwind a couple turns that I tied it down with, and then catch it again. So now I've got it tied on and tied off with the same three or four turns. Um, it's not a huge deal on a 14, on a size 18 it's a bigger deal, just to, to conserve the thread wraps. And I'm going to get a little more dubbing wax here. So the thorax, this is the part that varies on this fly. So if you're tying an olive one, you use olive dubbing. If you use the orange, you do orange dubbing. That's what's going to vary. You could change your thread color too, but it's not going to make a huge difference. So I'm going to take a little pinch of this brown dubbing. Twist that down nice and tight. So Charlie, when you dub, do you slide 
No. On GSP thread, I can because it's so slick, but I don't like to slide dubbing. So when you twist your dubbing onto the thread, if you do it right, it's stuck. It should, it should be very hard to get off. So if you slide it, you just loosen it. Um, so I don't move my dubbing around. I try to get it as close to the hook as I can, and it's almost always, see that's a finger width away from the hook, because I can only dub up to the hook point because otherwise I twist my finger into the hook point. Um, and you can see there's probably plenty of holes in that fingertip anyway. So that's just a self-defense mechanism. Now GSP thread is a little, I mean I can't, can't dub that any tighter and it's just because of the nature of that thread. Um, for just future reference, A dot unit thread or 6 dot unit thread, the texture of that thread is the best thing in the world to dub on. It's very, very corrugated, it's got a lot of texture to it so you're dubbing sticks to it well. So I'm going to build up a thorax here and it's just a little bit of a tapered thorax. See these butt ends that I cut off? Are those show yeah, they're showing up there. Um, I leave those just barely exposed, just as a reference point. So I've just built that thorax. <clears throat> and it's just sort of an egg shape there. So now I'm going to take some coastal deer, and this is going to become the wing. Um, so this forward wing is going to be our skating platform, and this is going to become our wing. So coastal deer is proportioned deer hair. Um, one of the, this is a nice chunk, too. I'm trying to get it where you can see it. Um, one of the things I look for, you know, Archie Best always goes on and on in his books about, you know, you want to use a piece of deer hair from the, you know, right upper shoulder of, the, of a mule deer killed on April 13th. Um, you know, nobody has a whole deer hide. No, you, you know, you, you, that does you no good when you're looking for a chunk of deer hair. What you want to know is what to look for when you're in the shop and hanging on the wall. Um, so what I'm looking for, see how straight this line between the gray and the, and the tan is? You know, I've used that piece up. See how it's very distinct? That tells me that that hair is all the same length and same age and same texture. Um, if that line is jagged, that's in a molting phase where there's some long hair, there's some short hair, there's a little bit of everything. So the straighter that line, the better off you're going to be. So I'm going to cut a clump of this out. And I always start with a much bigger clump than I'll need because I'm going to clean it. And I don't usually do this up on top of the table, but you can see there's a little fuzz hanging out of there. It's still going to have under fur. This is the same proportionally um, as, the, as the yearling elk. Short black tips, and you can see on that wing how short those black tips are. Um, I want an abrupt tip to the tip of the hair. I don't want a long, wispy tip. Um, that's going to give me hollowness right out to the end of the hair so the fly will float better. But I'm going to treat this the same way. I'm going to grab it by the very tips, clean all that short stuff out. That's mostly just under fur. See how not much hair fell out of there? That hair is all the same length. Hit this in my stacker, and again, I'll start in the big one, kind of get an idea of what I've got. I don't really try to gauge the amount of hair until I've got it in my smaller, or until I've stacked it, I should say. And I'll stack it up in my small stacker, and again, just nice, tight, tidy little bundle. See how distinct that black band is? See how they're all exactly the same length? That's a good chunk of hair. Same hair you'd use for a comparison. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So I'm going to take this clump of hair. And I'm going to measure it against this front wing. I wanted a shank length long also. Um, if you're not confident that you got your first measurement right, measure it against the hook shank, but they should be the same. Um, the wing should be a shank length long. The hook is definitely a shank length long. So you can use either one of those. But um, that's the measurement that I'm going for there. And you can see I'm just kind of closing my fingernail right up. To, I use my thumbnail here on this side to measure right where that's going to line up. Then I'm going to butt my fingers together. Get this where you can see it. Then I'm going to cut that off square. See how my scissors cut straight through that, didn't push it out? If your scissors won't do that, go buy some new ones. That's what scissors are for. Um, if you got to chew through stuff, I like to say I see it in classes all the time. If you got to chew through stuff, it's time for a new pair of scissors. You know, fight tying is supposed to be fun. Don't, don't fight it. I get this end. He's right here. Oh, he's flying. I, I was He's right here. I got him. Okay. There's a couple of them. Yeah, There's another one. Just get up to your I think they're all coming out of your material. They may have came on my back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just quarantine them the way <laughs> Just what I needed. Those are Colorado ants. <laughs> right. I've never seen ants that small. They must be Texas ants. Yeah, that's what they all say. <laughs> so I've got those buttons. I just cut those square across. 
Um, I'm going to turn this just a bit. I want you to get a good angle. So see the 45-degree uh, void between the, the flared wing and the yeah. butt ends? Okay, that's what I'm shooting for there. And I, so I've got them butted right up against there. I'm going to try to keep my face out of the way while I do this. But same two turns. Your face is I, it, it will be. i just got to see what I'm doing. Okay, same two turns. Then I'm going to flare that down. So see how those just rounded down into... I, all I did was pull on it. It's just softer hair than that yearling was. Okay, so my thread cuts into it a little bit better. And that's a circumferential flare? Uh, this is top half. Top, top half. half. Yep. Okay. So X caddis, exact same move. Um, really, elk hair caddis is sort of the same move. You've got to make a bigger band because it's harder hair, different hair. Um, but any kind of soft hair wing like this, that's a, it's the same move. So now I'm going to take and divide this wing. And I usually count them. About like so. The wing's a little longer. I'm going to leave it. So I just sort of part it with my fingers. And then I'm going to take these butt ends for this hump. And, you know, when I first started tying this fly, um, I, when I'd go to pull this through, some of those hairs would stick through this, this hump. Um, and then, so then I, you know, like a humpy, what I do is I roll it up into a clunk and pull it through so I could pull it through like a rope, but then I didn't like the way it looked when it was twisted. So then I finally figured out that I could twist it as I pulled it through and then untwist it once it got up there. <laughs> Duh, yeah, uh-huh. That's exactly what I said. I'm going to put two turns, and see how I can go right through those wings? I used to really try to avoid them. It's not a big deal. So I put two turns there. I have not pulled on them yet. I'm going to pinch from the bottom and pull straight down to flare those butt ends up. Then I'll grab all of those and cut those flush right down against those other butts, so they just kind of blend in. Um, see what we're talking about with surface area? See how big this fly got? So now I'm going to spread this front wing out with my thumbnail. Sweep it up and back, and I'm going to build a thread dam right up against its front edge. See the thread head area here? It's sort of elongated. That's why I built that thread dam to begin with, because I want to stand that wing up, not at a 90, but at about a 45. So it's got that skating edge on it. And then I can whip in it. <coughs> and then you can kind of fan everything out. Give you the top view. So see how that flies round from the top? Yeah, that's beautiful. It looks like a parachute from the top. But from the bottom, we've got a perfect skating caddis pattern. This fly is, is the most fun fly I have to fish. Um, and, and my buddy Matt and I, we fish together all the time. And we always say to each other, like, you've got to let him eat it. you got to, yeah, because it's just fun to watch him chase it. Um, you know, they blow up on it, they blow up on it, because you can skate it all day long. But you've got to stop and let it drift for them to catch it. Um, I like to watch him splash around, so I let him jump after it all day. Um, I grease up a little bit of the leader. You know, I'll grease up the tippet, and I'll grease the fly up. Um, usually kind of cast it down and across. When I first came up with this fly, it was the idea was that it was a skater. Um, I am amazed how well it works just dead drifted up tight to the bank like a spit caddis, like a flat dead caddis. Um, really a cool, fun fly to fish. They, they really do eat the tar out of it. During the summer months, this, this is about the only caddis pattern I fish anymore, just because it's more fun. Um, it's not, you know, an X caddis they still eat. There's lots of other caddis patterns that they still eat. But um, on those broken freestone streams, a, a fly like this that you can skate. The cool thing, too, is if you have an inexperienced angler, you can't, you can almost pull this fly back toward you like a streamer. You, can, you can't fish it wrong. You can drag all you want. Um, drag it upstream, drag it downstream, drag it, you know, I throw it into the bank, I'll drag it straight out, and they'll come chase out after it. Um, you know, it's a fairly small profile from the bottom, so they don't know the jig's up, and it's something they haven't seen tons of. Um, Umqua picked this fly up for about a year and a half, and then it got discontinued because nobody knew what it was for, um, which does not really hurt my feelings because I do. Um, so, so, so will that be showing up on the fly rocks? Uh, I think it's already in it. Is it? I think okay. it is. Yeah. Hey Charlie, with the, the GSP uh, thread, can you use the same head cement that you? Or would this Absolutely. require? Absolutely. Yeah, you can use the same head cement. Does it bleed through or anything? Yeah. So I, I will say this: the. Uh, um, GSP threads are notorious for the dye not sticking to them, and it's because they're not porous. Um, so the dye doesn't, like when I tied that big batch, I tied them with orange threads, and the, my bobbin tube was colored for weeks afterwards. Um, so the dye does come off. 
Um, it, there's not any place really for it to bleed into on this fly. Okay. Um, but I, I don't use GSP much because of things like that. Now, uh, Simperfly makes it in a bunch of different colors. Most of the other companies just make it in white, and that's what I generally use it in. You can hit it with a marker if you want a different color, but I mean, you see how much of it shows at the front. There's not enough to worry about. What size is the hook typically for this pattern? 14, 16. Yeah, I, I fish more 14s than, you know, the, it, again, you know, everybody talks about Colorado, you know, tiny little flies, tiny little flies. I fish as many size 14 flies as I do size 20 flies. It, you know, it varies river to river for sure, but those free stones, I mean, 14 and 16 are king. That's, that's what I fish most of the time. Um, you know, some of the, the tail water stuff, obviously, you got to go smaller much of the time. But I, uh, my buddy caught a 22-inch fish on a size 14 Screaming Banshee last Wednesday in an 11-mile canyon, so on the plat, you know, it, at 50 CFS. Um, it just it matches the bug that they're looking for. Fun little fly to fish. And I don't know. Do you like the odd size hooks? Um, yeah, I, again, it's just like I did with those fire hole hooks, you know, like the odd size. I still think, like, okay, it's a 15, that means it's a 14. But, you know, I, I, that's just how it goes in my head. I don't know that really that they fit in between. There's enough different hook sizes these days between extra long, extra short, curved, straight, blah blah blah. That you know, if you needed a hook that was 11.27 millimeters long, it's out there. Somebody makes it. Um, you can get it. Like fly lines. Exactly like fly. We were just talking about that. Exactly like fly lines. Am I out of time? Yes. Yes, sir. Only a little out of time. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Okay.